my name is Sean Kay and I'm the programme leader for Foundation Art and Design at the British Highest School of Art and Design in Moscow. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the second International Network of Foundation Educators Symposium, the foundation course in art and design, past, present and future, collective imaginings, which the British Higher School of Art and Design is very proud to be hosting again, this time in conjunction with Future Lab in Shanghai. And if this sounds familiar or similar to what I said yesterday or yesterday's introduction, uh, I do apologize, but uh, I'm very aware that we've got colleagues joining us today who couldn't come yesterday, even though we've got some people who are returning. <clears throat> so Future Lab is an annual international platform for art and design education, which brings together the world's outstanding art and design colleges and universities, focusing on innovative practices and the latest challenges for education today. And I will particularly Hello. thank Ling Min, for inviting INVI to host our second symposium in conjunction with FutureLab. This is a Zoom webinar, and if you'd like to listen in Chinese, then please go to the interpretation icon bar at the bottom of Zoom and select Chinese. We had such a strong submission of proposals from this, uh, for this event that we've had to extend what we initially envisaged as being a one-day event to this current two-day event. So uh, the first day was yesterday, and this is the, the, the second day today. <clears throat> We're working across massive time zones. It's currently just after 10 a.m. in the UK. It's just after one o'clock here in Moscow, uh, and it's just after six o'clock uh, in Shanghai. So Future Lab closes each evening at six o'clock, and a recording of yesterday's event was screened at Future Lab today, and a recording of today's event will be screened tomorrow. I'd also like to thank Ali Banis and Gaya Agin at the British High School of Art and Design here in Moscow for working so hard to make this event happen from a technical perspective, not least for providing Future Lab with the recordings that they're screening. And I'd also like to thank Irina Katashova, who is um, supplying our Chinese translation. So INVI is a recently formed professional association for individuals with an interest in foundation level art and design education. And it had its roots in a two part conference titled The History Uncovered, The Future Imagined, which took place at Tate Britain and then at Paris College of Art in 2013. And that was put together by Chloe Briggs and also another conference that Joe Woodhouse ran at the Baltic in Gateshead in 2017, titled Foundations of a Creative Curriculum. And the first INVI Symposium, the Foundation Course in Art and Design, a celebration, took place on the 22nd of June, 2021, and was also an online webinar, again, hosted by the British High School of Art and Design in Moscow. <clears throat> and we received such positive feedback, both during and following that event, that this second symposium is now being staged less than six months later. And a recording of the first symposium is on YouTube for those who are interested. <clears throat> and I'd also like to acknowledge the importance of FAB Foundations and beyond the conferences that Paul Stafford ran for many years at Kingston University and later at the University for the Creative Arts um, as also being an important forerunner of these in the symposiums. Uh, UEL have also for some years run an interesting annual foundation conference, but this has been specifically for centres running the qualification of that awarding body, whereas these INFI symposiums aim to be more inclusive in our understanding of what a foundation year might constitute internationally. So over the course of this symposium, we will have had 18 speakers, nine yesterday and nine today, who will each deliver a Pecha Kucha presentation offering different insights on the foundation course in art and design from a range of perspectives. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the Pecha Kucha format, it's a concise and dynamic way of presenting information. It usually takes much rehearsal and planning and can often be a rather nerve wracking experience. So I ask you to appreciate the preparation that's gone into these presentations that we're about to hear. <clears throat> for those of you who don't know, a Petra Kucha presentation consists of 20 slides shown for 20 seconds each. So each talk will only last for six minutes and 
40 seconds. The presentations have been arranged into four strands, each of which will be chaired by a member of the INVI steering group. So yesterday began with an uplifting initial address from Ricky DeMarco. Ricky spoke about the potential and the power of visual art in our contemporary world. <clears throat> Interestingly, in relation to the attendees at this symposium, he reminded us that both himself and Joseph Boyce thought of themselves primarily as art teachers. In the student perspective stand, chaired by Joe Woodhouse, we had a series of inspiring presentations ranging from two Russian students who studied on foundation only last year, discussing their introduction to performance practice, <clears throat> to a mature student um, recalling her foundation course uh, and how it enabled her to develop an art practice directly after foundation, to a conversation between two art educators and artists who teach at different higher education institutions, but studied on foundation together, talking about the importance that they place on foundation and how it constantly shapes their teaching practice. The project's Shifting Mechanics strand, which was chaired by Joan Beadle, again had an amazing range of presentations from the multifaceted curriculum of a Chinese academy to the development of a performance project that sought to offer students safe space through to the establishment of an ongoing public sculpture project in a London park. Today, we'll have presentations from the Foundation History Strand, chaired by Chloe Briggs, and from the Manifestos and Emerging Pedagogy Strand, chaired by Magnus Quiff. Magnus has kindly allowed us to press ganging into chairing one of the strands after giving a very engaging presentation himself at the first Invis Symposium. Both yesterday's and today's events are being recorded and they will be available later via YouTube. Each strand leader will introduce the theme of their strand and then introduce each individual speaker. And at the end of each strand, um, the chair will then chair 15 minutes of questions and you can ask questions by typing into the Q&A bar at the bottom of Zoom. The chair will then read out those questions to the panel. So if your question is to a specific panel member, please can you make that clear in the Q&A. <clears throat> There'll be a short break between each stand so that you can make a cup of tea, a cup of coffee, etc. Um, as the Invi Steering Group, we're very excited by the quality of proposals that we've received. We've had an amazing series of presentations yesterday, and I'm sure that we're in for another very stimulating day of short talks today about different aspects of foundation. Uh, and on that note, I'm going to hand over to Chloe. Thank you, Sean. Uh, <clears throat> so when I arrived from the UK to start my job as head of foundation at Paris College of Art, formerly Parsons Paris, a university working with an American structure of education in France, I quickly realized that I had a lot of research to do. The American model for a foundation course has, was distinctly different to what I knew in England and different again from the French program they call prépa. I started to understand that the history of art and design education is as rich as the history of art and design itself, and it's inevitably entwined. The movement of key figures, um, artists and designers, designer teachers and their students over the course of the 20th and into the 21st century, who moved countries, changed cultural context, exchanged and disseminated ideas, is key to understanding where we are now, wherever we are teaching the foundation course from. A complete survey, history of the foundation course from its conception at the Bauhaus, to today is yet to be written, and I think it would be fascinating. Today we have three presentations from Doug, Doug Bowen in Russia, uh, Stuart Bennett in Scotland, Judith Winter, whose presentation is from the UK's presentation will be read by Joan Beadle. Um, these three presentations give us some insight into some important chapters of that history, and I know will inspire us to know more about the roots of the foundation as we know it today. So Doug Bowen lives and works in Moscow, Russia. He is an artist and teaches at the British High School of Art and Design. 
He is exhibited at It's Kind of Hard to Explain, Margate, Outpost Norwich, Eastside Projects, Birmingham, Two Queens, Leicester, among others. He contributed to the publication as exhibition, an exhibition as publication, annotated Sachs Compendia created by Jonathan P. Watts and Ryan Gander. He is co-director of Blip 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 in Moscow and has worked on other collaborative and collective projects such as Leeds Weirdo Club and XO Leeds. Over to you, Doug. Foundations 100 Years After the Kutamas is an exhibition I co-curated at Blip 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 in Moscow from November 2020 till February 2021. A version of that exhibition is now on display at Future Lab in Shanghai. Blip 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 is cur a curatorial program which was established in Leeds in 2011 by Sean Kay and Harry Meadley. It then relocated to Moscow and now includes myself and Misha Levin. Blip 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 is committed to examining and fostering relationships between art practice and art education. It functions as an exhibitions program and informal module for students. Art students are encouraged to volunteer and supplement their official course curriculum to be involved in the running of the program, installing and invigilating exhibitions through to helping artists realize works and curating exhibitions. Foundations 100 years after Vakutamas celebrated the centenary of Vakutamas. This talk will elaborate on the exhibition and its speculation that part of Vakutamas' continued legacy is the establishment of the foundation course, a program that continues to underpin all facets of British art and design education. In the Soviet Union in 1918, as a result of radical reforms in art education after the October Revolution, Svomas was formed. Svomas was a radical art school that aimed to allow the underprivileged access to education. Entrance exams were abolished, faculty was replaced by avant-garde artists, and students chose faculty-nominated professors uh, that were then elected by student committees. In 1920, Svomas was replaced due to there being no synthetic unity, as Kandinsky called it, by Vakutamas. Faculty and students were charged with the mandate of implementing a new state doctrine and aimed at developing a, few, a fresh artistic culture and building a communist future. Often reductively referred to as the Soviet Bauhaus, the school closed in 1930 when it was abolished by Stalin. Concurrently in Germany between 1919 to 33, another interdisciplinary radical and experimental art school existed, the Bauhaus. Both schools had a common aim to unite arts and crafts and infuse artistic versions of modern process and production. I'm sure all of you know of or have heard of the Bauhaus, but probably not the Kutamas. But funnily enough, the Bauhaus was actually 10 times smaller than the Kutamas. For example, in the first year of the Kutamas, 1920 to 21, they enrolled over 2,000 students. Meanwhile, the Bauhaus had just 119 students. The Bauhaus founder, Gropius, knew of, of Svomas. He was the chairman of the Workers' Council for the Arts, which were in cultural exchange with the Department of Visual Arts in Moscow. This led to Gropius and Vakutamas establishing student exchanges and group exhibitions of both schools as students and faculty. Maybe this paved the way for a lot of Vakutamas' staff to then teach at Bauhaus, such as architects Alexei Shushev, Nikolai Ladovsky, Konstantin Melnikov, and painters Kazimir Malevich, Elisidsky, and Vasily Kandinsky. So if there's such a link between the schools, why is Vakutamas not credited? Overall, the Kutamas never really found a unified artistic voice due to its size and numbers. The school's leadership, politics and personnel changed numerous times throughout its existence, which also led generally to departmental rivalry in different specialisms. Unlike the Bauhaus, whose marketing posters, brochures, postcards and books were circulating around the world, the Kutamas and its workings remained largely unknown in European circles due to the language barrier and lack of printed matter. The curricular and organizational structures of the two schools were almost identical. First year students in both schools were required to complete a preliminary course before specialization. Um, this was an important part of the new teaching method and was considered the foundation of their art and design education. Vol course in Germany, a six month course with a focus on theory of form and experiments with materials and Propodevtika in Russia, a two year course focusing on space, volume, graphics and color. Importantly, Propodeptica did not simply offer an introductory system of courses that preceded a deeper study of a subject, but sought to provide an abbreviated exposition of an entire field of knowledge in a systematic and elementary way.
The, Brit uh, the British basic design course is initially developed at Leeds College of Art and King's College in Newcastle were directly influenced by the Bauhaus for course. And I'm arguing that more indirectly by Vakutamas's proper devtika. Foundation courses in Britain grew out of the basic course developed by Harry Thubron and Tom Hudson at Leeds College of Art in the late 1950s. From this and similar experiments undertaken by Victor Passmore and Richard Hamilton at King's College, a new introductory course for art, design and architecture students emerged called the Foundation Course. The Foundation Course was quickly adopted by art schools across Britain as the essential first year undertaken by all art and design students before they progressed to specialist undergraduate programmes across the range of art and design disciplines. At the British Higher School of Art and Design, the foundation course as an experimental program is now flourishing once again in Moscow. The program builds on both the radical tradition established in Britain in the 60s and before that, and before that 100 years ago at the Kutamas in Moscow. The continued othering of the Kutamas does not only still hinder a rightful assessment of its original contributions in art and architecture, but also prevents us from considering its idiosyncratic and only seemingly disordered pedagogical culture and possibly its link to foundation education today. Interdisciplinarity is still relevant today. Coincidentally, possibly symbolically, tonight in Moscow, VAC's Guest 2 opens. It aspires to reimagine the late 19th century Russian house of culture by con connecting under one roof art exhibitions, music, theatre performance, <laughs> film films, and learning. <laughs> Thank you, Doug. I'm sorry you were cut off on that last bit with the sound coming in, <laughs> but it was exactly what I, I meant in my introduction was um, that we would learn from the presentations here. That that was brilliant. And I, it makes me realize, like along with so many other things, the lens with which we're looking through history and how we have to shift it. <laughs> there are other stories there that haven't been told and that, that was amazing. Thank you. Um, over to Stuart now. Stuart is a senior lecturer and senior personal tutor at Edinburgh College of Art in the University of Edinburgh, currently working on the adaption and the renewal of ECA's graduate shows and events. Previously, he held various roles as the head of School of Art um, at ECA, deputy principal and acting principal between 2009 and 2019. He was trustee for the Council for Higher Education in Art and Design from 2018 to 21, and he also recently joined the Board of Trustees for Collective Gallery Edinburgh. Stuart was co-lead on QAA-funded QAA Creative Arts Collaborative Cluster under QAA Enhancement Time, Evidence for Enhancement, Improving of Student Experience, a collaborative group representing a range of creative arts in the higher Scottish higher education sector. Sorry, I'm just going to go back. <laughs> Give me 20 more seconds. <laughs> um, Stuart has developed exhibitions and local specific projects and has written and spoken about his work nationally and internationally. He's an artist and educator and concerned with the activity, conditions and tools of making and how experience of creating things can be demystified. Over to you, Stuart. Thank you. Hi everyone. Purpose. This is the inventor of Tupperware's notebook. Here he captured not only an idea, but an entire methodology. Quote, to live widely and fully, then invent. Not too radically to be accepted by a conservative people, but the most logical step in each trend. Errol Tupper's notebook is part invention, part of diary. Perception. Most Scottish degrees are four years long. Originally, first year, the foundation year was based on studying philosophy. The hypothesis is that before you think about a subject, you need to know how to think. Is foundation and potentially the first year in Scotland the last bastion of teaching, thinking how to think? Apprehension. I'm not I'm sure I agree with this statement, 
But I do recognise as our university launches a futures institute and transforms its curriculum, that some allegedly new ways of thinking and doing have been at the core of foundation teaching in art colleges for a very long time. Assertion, this is true. And the calibration of these three things is key. At Edinburgh, students from ECA can take courses across the university and students from across the university can take ECA courses these th without the hurdle of a portfolio and they are on equal footing with the art students. Residue, what is made apparent, what is written, read or learnt isn't always obvious. Foundation identifies an engagement with the ways in which our practices, techniques and technologies organise us and it is a way to understand the organisation and inevitably to then reorganise ourselves. Heuristic, but we don't know this at the time and we can't learn it without doing and learning something for ourselves through doing, discovering. This isn't a reiteration of knowledge and sometimes we need to ventilate, let light in and use the everyday to guide us. Method. Recently I started to slow roast cauliflower, a method I highly recommend. The oven is the tool. I swither about method and tools. It's easy to suppose foundation courses in art schools are overlooked in universities, but equally the methods of other disciplines offer tools to extend our reach. Register. In 1940, Dr Norman Heatley of Oxford University designed this vessel inspired by hospital bedpans for culturing penicillin for testing. Transparent glass, the preferred material, was needed in wartime, so a slip cast ceramic model was produced. The flat sided containers could be stacked. A tune. I have a friend who writes about whiskey. He told me about a tintometer that measures the tone of malt whiskey. This is a tonometer, an instrument that determines the frequency of sounds. It provides carefully measured standards against which other sounds can be compared. Dwelling. I'm intrigued by what museums tell us about our objects. This is 1.4 million years old. Its medium is volcanic rock. I'm not sure if it's a hand axe or, or if it should be broken to smaller blades. It's sometimes called a biface. It's a two-faced object. Gauge. This microscale navigation system can measure position with high precision, even when GPS is unavailable. Developed to provide full integrated positioning and navigation for aircraft and missiles, they have a relationship to Peter Halley paintings, but maybe only visually discuss. Appropriation. In 1881, the old Glaka Lakota chief Big Road produced this after his band was assigned to the Standing Rock Indian Agency and they demanded a list of his followers. Contemporary Lakota artist Arthur Amiotti use scraps of the images from it in one of his signature collages. Technologies. This is a soroban. Before electronic calculators, Japanese merchants used sticks to track the results of routine calculations. By 1800, the abacus was adopted from the Chinese. Different from the Chinese abacus, this features distinctive biconical beads which were easier to manipulate. Circadian. Joseph Friedman's best known invention is the flexible straw. He frequently sketched on envelopes, working out ideas and solving problems, as here, quote, lays flat, moves to vertical position to use, case used as handle, brush does come out completely. Preoccupation. This is a sketch for comb designs. It was made by the inventor of Tupperware. With each invention, he dated it, noted it in a diary notebook, began a folder on it as work starts, placed all bills, letters and sketches relating to it in the folder and made an outline of progress for each one. Invention. The earliest American patent for a clothespin was granted in 1832, though designs for hanging one's laundry were likely known in England before then. In 1853, Vermont inventor David M. Smith patented a groundbreaking version of this device that employed two hinged arms. Ultradisciplinary. In the early 1600s, French architect and engineer Salomon de Caus studied and wrote about diverse subjects like landscape design, mythology, steam and solar power, and the creation of pipe organs. I imagine him as a foundation course leader. 
diary. This is a time ball, a mnemonic device, a memory aid unique to the Klickakat and Yakama people from 100 years ago. How might we remind ourselves of our learning through making now? Is this an early blog? Experience. This particular example of Shifu is a sweat protector. It is a type of paper undergarment worn during the summer to keep the wearer cooler in the heat. It should be issued to all foundation students prior to the first critique. <laughs> Navigation. The stick was the first tool I used on foundation. Can the future of foundation extemporize other disciplines, tools and methods to extend our reach? And how do we influence other forms of learning? We are part of a universality of experience, not a monotechnic. The last 14 slides look like and are not art. My foundation made me know this, but didn't make me know how long it would take to know it. Thank you. Sorry, someone forced mute on me. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. <laughs> I'm just going back. <laughs> uh, bear with me. Apologies. Uh, Stuart. That was the most amazing art history lecture I've ever seen. <laughs> I think you were like a kind of master of the culture format there um, and making art history. So making Im those images so vital and connected to making now, I, well, it makes me, made me want to make things. Sorry, I lost my, I lost my thread because I got all knocked out of the sequence there, but no, okay. I have more to say. I'll come back when we speak in a minute. Um, so, over to Judith now. Um, her presentation is being is being read by um, by Joan Beadle. Judith Winter is an independent curator and lecturer in critical and contextual studies at Gray School of Art, Robert Gordon University. She was formerly inaugural curator for Middlesbrough Institute of Modern Art and head of arts for Dundee Contemporary Arts. Winter's current research is on art school reform and the educational philosophy of the Bauhaus. Over to you, Joan. Thanks, Chloe. Um, Judith has provided us with some um, images and some text to read. So the text I'm reading is an extract from a chapter that she's um, submitting for publication in a book that's been edited by Tim Ingold, and it's due to be published shortly by Bloomsbury. So I'm just going to read as the slide play. A short statement about why listening to the foundational principles of modern art education matters for our collective futures. What I propose is that the art school environment has always been most potent in times of crisis and uncertainty. So whilst I begin by lending my voice to all those who wish to reclaim the values of the civic university more broadly, my primary concern here is with the foundational ethos and values that underpin art education. The present HE environment stands at some distance from my own student experiences, firstly on the foundation course in Middlesbrough in the mid 80s, and then at St. Martin's School of Art in 1985 to 1988. Returning to the teaching environment in 2015, following a career working as an arts professional and curator, threw a spotlight on the considerable changes that had taken place over recent decades. I continue to be driven by a core belief in the transformative potential of the art school environment, but I'm also convinced of the need to turn away from current demands for the management of knowledge and to listen again to the pedagogic ethos and philosophy that was foundational to modern art school reform, one that recognised that the task for education was how to create a system that remained responsive to changing situations. To begin with a quote from the artist educator Joseph Albers in 1935, life is change, day and night, cold and warmth, sun and rain. It's more in between the facts than the facts themselves. I believe it's now time to make a similar change of method in our art teaching, that we move from looking at art as part of a historical science to an understanding of art as part of life. These words were spoken at a moment when Albers begin, was beginning a new life with his wife, Annie Albers, teaching at Black Mountain College. One of the core challenges for the future of art schools, Albers argued, was to overcome the impulse in mainstream cultural theory to understand life retrospectively rather than prospectively by looking back on what has come to pass rather than joining the ongoing fashioning of the future. Albers believed that the next generation faced a stark choice 
choice, either to remain mired in a dead past or to find ways of imagining and embracing an alternative future. His experiences in Germany convinced him that mass society was more confused than ever and that profiteering and tradition were turning out a future of administrators and civil servants instead of creating the conditions needed to propagate perceptive and empathetic citizens who could make choices and decisions that were really their own. At the Bauhaus, the Volkers, the preliminary art course, was introduced by the artist educator Johanna Zitten. The course was intended to return to first principles, to break the cycle of imitation and clear the baggage of inherited practices and accumulated knowledge. The pedagogical principles of the Bauhaus arrived in Britain by way of the networks and associations forged by the Bauhauslers as they sought refuge from political conditions in their home country. The Bauhaus philosophy was welcomed by an emergent generation in Britain who was seeking radical reform of social and aesthetic values and was particularly championed by artist educators in the industrial heartlands of, north of the north of England. Key advocates included Olive Sullivan at Manchester School of Art, artists Victor Pasmore and Richard Hamilton at King's College Durham and Tom Hudson and Harry Thrubron at Leeds College of Art. In common with the Bauhausler, these artist educators in Britain disassociated themselves from the traditions and methods of the academy. They were interested in creating an atmosphere where students could improvise and work in open and intuitive ways. Significantly, the proposal to introduce a foundation course that drew upon the Bauhaus approach came from an artist, William Coldstream, through his leadership of the National Advisory Council on Art Education. The Coldstream Report of 1960 radically transformed art school pedagogy by creating a bridge between secondary education and degree level courses, allowing a significant moment of pause beyond school life and before an unknown future. It enables students to challenge previously unquestioned assumptions and to overcome their existing circumstances, not just physically, but emotionally and intellectually as well. Avoiding disciplinary specialism, the foundation course instead drew students' attention to the values deemed essential for all creative practices, including observational drawing, lessons in colour and form theory, material studies and spatial dynamics. The importance of the foundation course is that it opens the imagination to possibilities far beyond our present circumstances, as the concentric circles of the Bauhaus curriculum reveal. It's essential for each student to find the direction of travel that's right for them, to recognise where their talents lie, where their dispositions and capacities might lead them. This notion of self-discovery is part of the zeitgeist of German culture. When I returned to teaching following a career in the arts, I was returning to an environment I hardly recognised, one that seemed to have forgotten its purpose, to challenge assumptions and prejudgments and to find new ways of seeing and doing. I also couldn't help but think that the issue were ones of our own making. In our rush to validate practice, we tethered the art school to an educational model that had a very different pedagogical philosophy. I became acutely aware that something had been lost in the continuity of art education. It was most apparent while working on the exhibition Bauhaus 1919 to 33 and Language of Vision at MIMA, Middlesbrough Institute of Modern Art in 2007. Fundamental to the educational approach of the foundation course was the principle of learning by doing expressed in the writings of John Dewey, amongst many others. The early 20th century one senses that atmosphere and revolutionary zeitgeist associated with the radical avant-garde is one we associate with grassroots reform and the spirit of manifestos and declarations, all with one thing in common, to find ways to influence systemic change, to avoid being boxed in, and as a way to remain in balance with technological innovation, to imagine and question and hold up a mirror to the world we are constructing for ourselves. The Bauhaus was not a label for mid-century modern design. First and foremost, it was a school for an emergent generation of creative citizens, artist educators, artists and designers across disciplinary boundaries. It taught spatial, material and human agency. Art and design education at the Bauhaus was founded on the principle that learning should not be restricted to a particular time of life and a location in which neophytes are magically transformed formed into adults, but should rather be understood as a process of discovery, a vehicle for ongoing investigative living and creative citizenship that can play a significant part in remoulding societal attitudes and collective futures. Pedagogic experiences that influenced almost every studio in art schools across the globe. What I propose here is to steer things in a new direction. We need to reclaim that environment. Rather than seeing these pedagogic experiments as a chapter in the history of art and design, we need to draw attention to the relevance of the ideas they promoted to our present struggles. Thank you so much. There was so much in there. <laughs> extraordinary <laughs> um and maybe what there's so much in there i was trying to write as fast as i was listening um but 
I think something that came as an overall impression was how um, what was being taught or what was being um, fostered was this um, approach connecting art to life. And, and, and I think that was really beautifully expressed by some of the students yesterday. You could see how that was so meaningful that what happened on the foundation year was they could see how how what they were making was connected to their life. Um, uh, absolutely. It's, it's a very much longer chapter, which Judith has kindly um, you know, provided to us. We, we can use it as a resource as we put resources together for the um, symposium. So we have, um, thank you so much, all three amazing, amazing amount of, of information. Um, I, I know this is now open to Q&A, so anyone in the audience can send us um, questions, but maybe I have something just to start off, and it's for all three of you. Um, that I think one of the motivations for creating Infi and, and some of the the ways that people were talking yesterday certainly was that um, foundation has always felt kind of under threat or, 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 or always has always felt that it's challenged in some ways like it, what's its purpose why why is it here why are we still doing it and I wonder um, you know in the in in connection to to your to your different presentations um, what what could you see as the is the kind of enduring um, motivation for for this year of study um, connected to any of the histories that you're you're talking about is that too big of a question <laughs> it's quite big <laughs> i can i can come back to that if that's useful chloe i mean i think i suppose for me i'm talking about a very pers particular perspective in in our university where we're trying to make the most of having a four-year degree and make clear why that is unique and it just strikes me that in all the discussions that are happening across all three colleges in a very large research intensive university it seems that the discussions stem around some of the ideas that form the foundation course and I and I just I suppose what I'm trying to do and I see Neil's in the room now and he's part of these conversations too is trying to sort of say well yeah yeah we know about that stuff <laughs> you know like we've been doing that stuff for a long time and but equally not to say this is the way you should do it but to look at other disciplines and actually bring those into the art school and into our pedagogy because you know we teach we don't you know we're not we're not a monotechnic as i said in the, in the, in the talk or at least we shouldn't be so we should be sort of imbuing the curriculum with a sort of wide range of different inputs and we've got the opportunity to do that so that's that's where I'm coming from. Yeah, and there's actually a question from Neil. He he wants to ask you about the non-art example. Oh, he's got his hand up. <laughs> Go for it, Neil. You can unmute yourself. You're in the room. Hey. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Hey, hey Stuart. Uh, yeah, I, I thought uh, I was really interested in the fact that you showed so many examples of sort of not you know non-art or um, like material culture that's, that comes from sort of outside that <clears throat> construction of like art hood and uh, European terms. And I know you'd been looking a lot at um, Kubler and, and his book, The Shape of Time. I remember you talking about that a bit. And I'm, so I'm sort of wondering whether you, you where that comes in, that sort of um, decolonized understanding of, of some of the things we might look at in terms of material practices that maybe you know don't quite sit inside the chronology of arthood you know that before the renaissance say in europe or that simply are part of a completely different epistemology you know that that's uh this that's not not part of like what uh foundation tends to teach which is mm. you know the kind of european idea of what art might be yeah Huh. Yeah, um, I mean, those images <clears throat> came from an exhibition at Cooper Hewitt from 2013 called Tools. Uh, and I think it was called Extending a Reach, which, which I just nicked, because that's what we do, don't we? So, <laughs> so I kind of, and, you know, the, I suppose for me, you know, I just think that it's a personal thing, I guess. Like I find, like I find an interest in things that are already in the world. That are not art, and and then I find a kind of link to why they were made. I mean, all the, all those things I selected were made for really kind of creative reasons, but not by people that were trained in art schools. So there's something really, 
interesting about that for me because often the conversation is oh, we've got to keep this this is really valuable only us, only we can do it and actually i think that's not true i think there's a lot of different ways in which we can create a foundational year uh, i do think that making is actually utterly critical but not just for art students um for all students you know and and the other thing and you'll you'll know it keenly when we joined the university 10 years ago there was this idea that other students from across the university couldn't possibly do our courses because they you know they maybe they couldn't draw or something you know and then suddenly all our colleagues go actually those english literature students are really good at making artist books and you're like well yeah why wouldn't they be you've got an interest in it you know so there's a kind of I, so it's a slightly agitprop thing but also i'm just sort of interested i guess in what you're saying as well about finding things in history that wouldn't normally come into the conversation that's why it was the most exciting um <laughs> like series of slides or for those reasons um Joan's got her hand up. Yeah, it was just a comment really on, on the, the images that you showed, Stuart. Just it was great to see those things that were like the ephemera of process, like some of the, you know, the back of an envelope stuff that you, we rarely see, which was, was really good to see. Yeah, I mean, I, I think these things are sort of residue. And if you talk to students about, you know, what yeah. they make has been a kind of residue of a <coughs> formed life, then there's something sort of different comes from them you know mm. if you frame mm. it that way mm. it's a different mm. way of thinking mm. yeah i've got um i've got a question for doug about the um the fragmentation was the way i i, I remember you saying it of the the different uh, differing opinions in that huge um, foundation program, two thousand students, and it, it it didn't it didn't kind of make the history books in the same way because as the Bauhaus because it was not documented, um, or, or 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 in a way a kind of neat package of an art school, and I, and I and I wonder just to elaborate on that why so there's something about the energy of that that seems really exciting to you and your colleagues um, in in Russia today and how that's that's living on somehow. Yeah, I think maybe as well a reason was, you know, like marketing and things wasn't really as, as big a, it still isn't really as big a sort of thing in Russia. I mean, they're starting to sort of be more capitalistic and things, but maybe the the lack of sort of printed matter. I remember I was reading quite a bit about um, Alfred Barr Jr., the MoMA um director, founding director, and his interest in Fakutamas. And he, he couldn't, he, he's got the biggest collection, the biggest collection of Fakutamas uh, stuff, ephemera, is actually in America, which is quite strange. <laughs> and um, at the same time, he'd, he was creating this sort of like art kind of canon, canonical kind of diagram, um, was fascinated by Fakutamas, only included Bauhaus in how Bauhaus influenced art, but totally uh, sort of rejected Bakutamas or then showed Bakutamas artwork, um, but sort of under like a Bauhaus exhibition or something. It was quite, quite sort of strange, but yeah, I think the, maybe the, the scale of it, of all of these reforms, uh, maybe sort of yeah led to it not having a kind of succinct tight packaged uh, uh, and I think the language is obviously a problem like I was also reading about exchanges between yeah like Barr and like Kandinsky for example and um, they just couldn't really talk because of the language barrier too so I think there's quite a lot of lost, lost in translation. Mm -hmm. Having said that the, 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 the sort of lack of printed matter that's somewhat been made up for, for by Anna Bokov's uh, new mm. sort of tome on the Kotamas, which is which is amazing. So um, hopefully that will that will start to change. Joe, you've got your hand up. Yeah, I'd, I thought it'd be a general question to to all those in this strand because I think it's a really fascinating strand, and I, I thought. Judith's um, piece read by Joan um, perhaps touched on some of this, but I was just wanting to ask the contributors or anyone really, but um, in, 
this the idea of historical examples, Vicuta Mass, Bauhaus, others, um, it, you know, the ways in which those historical examples are useful and and some of the ways we might have to navigate or re reconsider that. And I, I thought it'd be interesting because we've got so many good presenters to ask people how if to clarify that perhaps. Do you mean how how useful is it to 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 take the the historical inspiration into our current teaching? Do you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, in what way? Because Julie's described um, maybe he's looking at uh, motivations rather than approaches, and I, I thought that um, uh, Stuart kind of was attempting to open that out as well, and I thought that was really interesting. Um, but I just wonder if, um, yeah, how people navigate those sort of things, how people utilize those um, historical examples. Neil's got his hand up there. Hey, uh, <laughs> yeah, I've got, I can even got a lot to say on that, I guess. Uh, well, I feel like the, this sort of uh, constant um sort of ancestor worship of of the foundations and foundations not that healthy in the one hand and it's also not very scholarly in terms of how it's used by foundation as as it exists currently uh, for example <clears throat> a lot of the stuff that we picked up or rather england has picked up on and the kind of foundations you found in newcastle and leeds and then it permeated and to say things that roy ascot did later on they, they really have their roots in pedagogy and particularly in uh, late 19th century, early 20th century uh, forms of pedagogy that are, you know, still around now, but are quite unusual. You know, I'm thinking particularly of Froebel and uh, the Froebelian approach to materials and so on. Now, all of those approaches are part of a kind of psychology moment uh, that's long gone. And, uh, you know, most people who work in psychology would discredit a lot of those ideas, as do a lot of educationalists now. And the other important thing to recognise is that we're all concerned with pedagogy. Pedagogy means teaching children, uh, very specifically. Uh, so foundation studies, because of the friction between um, Bauhaus artists and people like the Froberg Circle at that time, uh, the foundational approaches of, say, Bauhaus ended up basically adapting techniques and methods that were used to teach children. Hence, the sort of focus on unlearning and, and working with materials and trying to understand how they something might emerge from them and so on. And I think we've kind of inherited that in a totally uncritical way, not looking at the fact it's, it's rooted in teaching children, when what we do is andragogy. We teach adults uh, and foundation and an art school, uh, HE level. Uh, so there's a, a tendency to kind of miss all of that. There's no um, theoretical framework there that allows us to understand what's happening there. And therefore we're just kind of repeating all of the techniques. And uh, I would say <laughs> a, lot, a lot of the um, fallacies of early 20th century uh, pedagogy, specifically, you know, ideas about how we should teach children. So there's a huge amount of work to be done there to understand how that has, has kind of bled into what we are calling foundation here and what that does in terms of how it creates human subjects, like what, how, how do you create personhood through um, putting students through what we're calling foundation, what does that do to them if it has a a root in, say, Frevelian uh, children's education. So I, I think we, you know, certainly want to do some sort of organology and, and investigation and archaeology of some of that stuff, but we need to also subject it to some sort of rigorous scholarly critique and draw on educational uh, research there. Uh, and that's uh, really, I think, the, the job, uh, the time to do that is now, you know, it's very timely to decolonize that and, and start to think beyond it, be less, less self-congratulatory. What, who, who would you, um, could you, could you name text, so from what I understand what you're saying is to look at look, the history of, of pedagogy rather than the history of the foundation course would be more, more important. And that, and that 
Um, well, it's I'm, not it's not that it's just a question of situating it within yeah. the history of education per yeah. se, because it is just part of that. It's not a separate thing. Yeah. Uh, and it isn't exceptional in the way that perhaps we think it is in an art school. That's part of being in a bubble, uh, I think. But partly because of how we're uh, because how we socialize students in these uh, physical settings to to kind of rely on each other as as like uh, supportive peers, we tend to reproduce those kinds of uh, subjectivity, and and we can't really stand outside it the way, a, say, an ethnographer would. So yeah, we need to understand the history of education, and particularly you know some of those things that were going on around say the early twentieth century. But I think uh, we could, you know, we could really use some more kind of critical approaches like, you know, you could do like uh, participant observation style ethnographies of what's actually happening in, uh, say, studio teaching settings. Yeah, yeah the brilliant points. Um, yeah. Joe, you had your hand up first and then Sean. I, Sean, how much time do we have? I'm, I'm not being a very good timekeeper. <laughs> this is too interesting. <laughs> We've already overshot it slightly but we can we can readjust so okay I'll keep, it I'll keep it really short I think it is it's a really fascinating one there's this sort of tension isn't there and I, I, I know that Sean and myself would question the um what was held in the archive at the um in um Wake, Wake, Wakefield um on foundation on art education and with the way it stopped and I think it's really interesting to consider the way foundations have changed. And that's why I think for INFI, the conversations we have now are so vital, you know, in terms of bringing wider perspectives, wider experience and current practice into that sort of consideration as well. Um, but yeah, yeah, really interesting. Thanks, Joe. Sean? Yeah, the, the archives of Bretton Hall, Joe, that's what you're referring to, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> well, I was just going to say that uh, I think we'll, we often go right back to the beginning of foundation courses, uh, as in Leeds and Newcastle, Thubron and um, Passmore and Hamilton and uh, uh, Tom Hudson, as coming from Barhouse. And we, we, we often forget that the things that happened directly, well, so that was seen as a really big a radical shift when when the first foundation courses happened in in British art education but the people who, who came directly after them so Roy Ascot when he when he set the the ground course up um, initially in Ealing and uh, and then in Ipswich but also the Leeds uh, foundation course that, that went from Leeds College of Art to to the to the to the Met and things that, that, that was inherited of the, the Polytechnic that was that was inherited there because what had happened to them was so radical, they felt that they had to be really radical again. So the so the, the sort of performative aspects that were that were happening at Leeds Polytechnic and, and, and that Ascot was um, dealing with um, initially in Ealing really sort of moved that forward. And we often forget that. We keep we keep going right back to, to what came from Barhouse in the very beginnings of foundation courses without <laughs> thinking that they do shift on, they do shift forward. So there's, there's a long history and we often just go back to the beginning of it. Yeah. I just, um, yes, yeah, Stuart. Yeah, it's just to say that, you know, it's an interesting thing that, um, that's been discussed here in it. And, in a way, it's a kind of paradox. Like art schools are a sort of paradox, and and the only way that you can sort of reconcile that paradox is by keeping the differences in play all the time. So, and that's quite a difficult thing to do because as soon as you start to talk about you know curriculum renovation for one of a better expression, then people will say, oh yeah, that's what we used to do, or or we could take this because because we've done that before. Instead of kind of thinking of some form of renewal that you know doesn't, well, may well come from the histories of the foundation, for example, but may, may well also come from the idea of why stick charts exist to chart water and then are torn up and thrown away because they're not needed once you've charted the water. You know, a bit like the drawing that your tutor ripped up because it was crap when you're on your foundation in 1988 or something, you know. So there's a kind of, these paradoxes, are sort of, those differences are similar but different, but they need to be kind of kept in play all the time. Mm. Neil, you have another... Point. Yeah, yeah, just uh, 
to to add to that, like I've I've been thinking maybe like things like this Infi uh, organization are are maybe um, a good catalyst for trying to look at what constitutes the discipline, like what is art, uh, say from an art school perspective. And, uh, you know, it strikes me that pretty much every other discipline has gone through this kind of like navel gazing process. M- mainly they did it back in the early 80s. I'm thinking of like the new art history, for example. And uh, I feel like that was a healthy thing that they did. And it's created good foundations for them to uh, like decolonize themselves presently. But, you know, may- maybe like looking at, say, foundation studies uh, as the equivalent for art, uh, because to me it does well, at least in an English context, it, it really does harbour a lot of assumptions and uh, habits that are then carried on through people's whole lives in terms of how they just how they live and, and how they are as 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 people um, that are you know quite fundamental. So I think maybe some sort of close investigation. Uh, I don't mean you know it's it's purely navel gazing, but something like a, you know a turning back, a meta cognitive sort of process of looking at that. It's quite a healthy thing from from that perspective, uh, but it feels like it's overdue in in art schools. Uh, so just what Stuart's saying, you know, oh, we did that, or uh, we're already pioneers of such and such. None of that's actually true when you really look at what's going on in uh, education more widely and uh, educational research and so on. So yeah, it's long overdue. I was just thinking, you know, we we're spending all our time teaching. We don't have a lot of time to learn about teaching. <laughs> that, you know, that, and that's the, I mean, luckily I was lucky to, to learn about teaching. I mean, what we should be, it should be entwined all the time. Well, we don't te- necessarily like, have these moments. But then the act of teaching is a learning oh, process. Sure, sure, it, so we are sure. learning about it by doing yeah. it. But I suppose it's a question of like, um, it's not that you have to stop and do, you know, uh, uh, like scholarship of your teaching but you can be a kind of scholarly teacher yeah. and, and try and be aware of like what you're doing and why and I think we do that anyway you know, we adjust what we do we remove things that don't work and we try new things out so we're doing it anyway it's just we need to maybe kind of dig a bit further a bit deeper there and almost like you know psychodynamically what's going on behind this like why are we doing it this way there's not enough of that happening and maybe the the critical conversations across, you know, what I, what I'm proud of of Vimpy is we're not institution, we're not an institution. We are in different contexts, in different places. Um, we haven't got anyone from the US here in this in this one we did in the first. So it's a whole another whole um, perspective, ways of thinking, doing. Um, yeah, it's super healthy always. Um, so much to think about. Uh, Sean, I probably have to have round up. Do I? Uh, welcome back everybody and that was a really uh, amazing stimulating first strand three great presentations and some really um, great responses and conversation to it afterwards so thank you to all three presenters and and, the, uh, and everybody who's contributed to the discussion that came after it I've got a big apology to make because I, uh, when I I started writing some notes in my introduction on the back of my on the back of what I was going to say to introduce Chloe. So when I so I went through my introduction and then suddenly realised after after uh, Chloe took over that I, I didn't introduce her. So you've met the wonderful Chloe Briggs. Who um, I forgive yeah. you, Dawn. I forgive you. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I'm going to in in in, in retrospect I'm going to um, introduce Chloe. So. Um, Chloe Briggs is an artist and educator. In 2013, she created Drawing is Free as a way of bringing people together around the pleasure of drawing. Drawing is Free takes many forms, educational resources, online sessions, collaborations with community organizations and arts institutions. It's led by the belief in the quiet power of drawing to connect people and to sensitize us to the world. Since 2008, she's been the head of foundation at Paris College of Art, where she is a co-teacher of the first year drawing class. And in 2020, she created an online version of the foundation course that she delivers to students around the world. She regularly contributes to and organizes conferences about art education, most recently the Teaching Drawing Symposium organized by Drawing Projects UK and Drawing is Free in association with the Trinity Boy Wharf Drawing Prize. And in 2013, 
she researched, collated, and edited the publication, 72 Assignments, the Foundation Course in Art and Design Today, which is a major collection joined together foundation briefs and assignments from an international field of artists and educators. So, um, sorry that I didn't introduce you when I should have done, Chloe, but um, the, next, the next strand uh, is called Manifestos and Emerging Pedagogies, and it will be chaired by Magnus Quaif. Magnus is an artist and the Professor of Fine Art Pedagogy at the Academy of Fine Arts, UniArts Helsinki. His research sets out to let artist educators tell their own stories, to gather a diversity of experience and uncover hidden knowledge so that we might better understand potential futures. He's a founding director of the organization Teaching Painting and was pre previously the international lead for the Department of Art and Performance and the program leader for undergraduate fine art at Manchester School of Art. He's represented by Workplace Foundation in Newcastle as part of their community of artists. Over to you, Magnus. Thanks, Sean, and, and thanks to um, everyone who presented in the in the previous session. I, I hope this session uh, goes some way, perhaps, to answering Neil's call. Really, to think about um, the the differences of foundation as opposed to just its it, its histories. Histories. So this strand explores the manifestos and futures of foundational education in art and design. The world's changing with significant and unprecedented political uncertainty, mass migration, environmental change, technological development, heightened understandings of the challenges of equality, diversity and decolonization, and now pandemic. Arts education must ask how it can and should react. In many areas of the world in which the market is seen as the primary indicator of value, there have been sustained pressure to increase student numbers, reduce space, and consolidate other resources. Within this landscape, foundation courses have found themselves under perpetual existential threat. Yet, taken together, the presentations that follow offer insight into the significance of this intensive year of education, demonstrating how innovations in the field are preparing a generation of art and design students to engage in these new realities. Collectively, the presentations are broad in scope, grounded in practical and theoretical pedagogical understanding. They show that far from being stuck in the Bauhaus tradition, foundation courses are developing innovative new models of arts education. From the manifesto as a tool for developing students' understanding of themselves and each other, to pedagogical models of education, through pedagogies of diversity and the transformative potential of foundation courses. There is a common thread which runs through the strand that might be understood as developing of critically engaged creative communities. As such, they affirm Irit Rogoff's claim that education signals rich possibilities of coming together and participating in an arena not yet signalled even as those communities have been dispersed for extended periods during the pandemic. More than just a defense of foundation courses then, these presentations can be seen as a celebration of the powerful potential of what is so often a fundamental year in the education of artists and designers. So the first presentation is by uh, Neil Mulholland. Professor Neil Mulholland is the Chair of Contemporary Art Practice and Theory at the University of Edinburgh. He runs the MA Contemporary Art Theory Programme in Edinburgh College of Arts. Neil works with the artist Norman Hogg as the confraternity of neoflagellants. Con is a mismorphic weird machine, a black box wherein ferments the deanthropotechnic, phosphorescent and occasionally putrid critical, uh, sorry, cultic milieu. Uh, he also works with Dan Brown and Jake Watts as Shift Work, a group of artists who develop workshop models for artist pedagogy, participatory visual methods, and open educational resources. Neil recently published a book, Reimagining the Art School, uh, with Palgrave Macmillan, which develops the paragogic of Shift Work into a broader manifesto for the art school for art school reform, and contributed a Shift Work to leap into action. Uh, a reader on performative pedagogies in art education. Uh, 
So Neil's presentation, uh, Artistic Learning in the Open, will explore his use of pedagogical models of art education, which have developed as open educational resources at Edinburgh College of Art and Beyond. He will reflect on how, during the pandemic, this has nurtured virtual communities of foundational learners. Well, Holland points out that the foundations of artistic learning are not restricted to particular communities or stages of art education using the example of the foundation course at Edinburgh for postgraduate students transitioning from other fields. So over to you, Neil. I think the slide should be appearing now. Okay, so, um, yeah, thanks, Magnus. So all of this is uh, on my website. Uh, uh, as Magnus said, it sort of comes out of a shift work to some extent and uh, a book that I wrote a couple of years ago. Um, okay, I don't... Don't know if the slides have started, but seem to ah okay. Okay, so in 2019, I co-created Contemporary Art and Open Learning, which is an open educational resource that enables participants to open access to artistic learning by sharing their own learning practices. The OER practices are paragogics, which was pioneered in 2011 by Joe Cornelli. Paragogy's focus on making tacit knowledge explicit makes it particularly conducive to artistic learning. Art education has remained over-reliant on third placemaking as its primary means of socialising artistic learners. Paragogy offers a more flexible framework for peer learning, one that's adaptable to any given context. Moreover, paragogy engages participants in the open creation of research objects, such as free licensed artworks, pickpocket programs, open events, and so on. This in turn supports the formation of new publics that result from the circulation of these open research objects. Imagining which publics we might ferment through the shared production of open research objects is the focus of collective inquiry supported by art and open learning. Art schooling has an invisible hand in curating personhood, while educational theory tends to see subjectivization as something method-eccentric or socially overdetermined. Art and open learning prompts its participants to create new tools, methods, and probes that redress these limitations. Open courseware was sworn authored and rapidly play-tested and then made public as a word process, uh, as a WordPress. Its co-authors then joined distinct groups of formal learners who worked in shifts at the University of Edinburgh. Each group began by establishing a covenant, defining the parameters of our collective inquiry. The covenant acts as the playing and making environment or the basho for our practice. Each group then experiments with foundational concepts of openness, such as the open paradigm, swarming, and the educational turn in artistic practice and curating. This is essentially metacognitive. Groups will compose and play their own forms of artistic learning. The second stage of our OER then supports paragogues to run their own workshops within the frame of what we call an open art fair. So last December, our common point of inquiry here was Boyce's 78 provocation, Jeder Menschein Künstler, or can anyone be an artist? Rooted in Boyce's Edinburgh Poorhouse action object projects of 74, this seemed prescient of the emancipated potential of open creation, particularly during the pandemic lockdown. The Fluxus style scoring continued to haunt last week's iteration of the Open Art Fair, which was held at Edinburgh Sculpture Workshop in its open air yard. So enabling full freedom of modification, the five R's, retain, reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute, these artistic OERs are analogues of Boyce's action objects. They are open 
catalysts for holistic relational learning. Paragogues devise open methods of action learning and they fork what begins as faculty devised open resources into new open educational resources. And this looping reverberation has very quickly grown into an evolving repository of open workshop distributions. For example, my colleague Beth Danowski, who uh, devised, co devised the program, has versioned the OER as part of our HNC Contemporary Art Practice program at Glasgow Clyde College. Deb Jani Banerjee has used a version of it to teach primary five children at Edinburgh Sculpture Workshop as part of their uh, education program that she runs. And the Canadian curator Nevin Lockhead has created a fork of the open distro in Kingston, Ontario, as part of his Dark Matter playgroup. So the OER snowballs into a number of uh, new versions or new distributions this way. So in doing it together initiatives, we find that nurturing social relationships often precedes and counters any desire to try to codify those relationships through organizing or collectivizing for such purposes. OER's support for informal learning fits perfectly with arts post-rationalist ethics of care. The way in which artists acknowledge creation as a relational practice is continuously modified through doing it together. And as action objects, artistic OERs thus offer a great opportunity to create new publics for art by commoning, making, and learning. In conclusion, then, I'd say if we embrace the open paradigms vision of education as a human right, we might better equip art educational organisations to fulfil UNESCO's right to participate in cultural life, which I would say is foundational for our education. However, we must remember that cultural life is something fermented formally and informally. Working together, OERs and people can become symbiotic colonies of artistic learning and thus generative of new art worlds. Okay, that's me, thanks. Uh, thank you so much, Neil. It's it's a, a really fascinating presentation and uh, dense with with lots of different ideas that I think um, I'm uh, excited to learn more about. And um, for those of you who can attend uh, in in person, Neil's running a workshop at um, the, the art school here in Helsinki, and then with the afternoon of that will be online, so it'll be available to view. So you can. Uh, visit the Kuva website for the research days. And I hope some of those ideas will be uh, un unpacked a bit more there, Neil. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. I've got a whole day <laughs> to, to go through it, yeah. I'm, I, I'll, I'll send another quick link. I'm going to do another short workshop next Friday, uh, I think, called the OER uh, Global. Uh, if anybody wants to take part in that, I'll send a quick link. And I suppose the interesting thing about the models that you're uh, using and proposing and, and, and presenting and sharing through the open educational resource is that they do precisely what I think you were talking about before, which is um, uh, kind of refusing uh, monotechnical traditions and also looking beyond um, pedagogies which um, uh, constantly look inwards to try and uh, look to the broader scholarship of teaching and learning to, to um, uh, imagine other possibilities in arts education. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that's the great benefit of being, uh, you know, rooted in art as a, as a discipline. It's like a very extra disciplinary uh, beast. You know, it tends to sort of go into other areas and raid them and bring things back and, and kind of toy with them, play with them and make them into something else. Hybridize them, is, I think, is, is uh, generally what's going on. And that, that kind of freedom to be methodological, methodologically playful is kind of harder to, to win in other disciplines. Mm. Uh, so, you know, we have that kind of license, I think. We need to make use of it better than we maybe have been. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much, Neil. Um, the next presentation is by uh, Cham Zhu King. Uh, Cham is Associate Professor and the Coordinator of the Foundation College, uh, uh, sorry, Foundation Course at the College of Design and Innovation at Tongji University in China. 
Um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to Chan's presentation. For some reason, it's the only one out of all the presentations uh, that are taking place today that I didn't receive uh, a, an abstract for. So I can't offer any further insight before it begins, other than just to hand uh, directly over to and welcome Chan. Hello, everyone. I'm Zhang Xueqing from the College of Design and Innovation, Tongji University. I would like to give some introduction about the curriculum and share some thoughts of the foundation course in the first semester. This course is open to all first year students. They would have choice to different majors after first year study. Our majors include media and communication design, industrial design and environmental design. Thus it is a broad platform foundation curriculum. Design is a way to observe and understand the world around us. We designed the foundation course because we believe that before learning how to design, students should learn how to observe, build their own perspectives and ask questions. The course composed into four sections, natural objects, digital objects, artificial objects, and place narrative. The first topic is observation and the recording of nature objects. We ask students to choose a fruit or vegetable to observe. For example, bitter melon, pepper, etc. We guide students to observe and record its shape, structure, and microenvironment respectively especially observe the process from freshness to decay. The students can record it by drawing it on a 10 meter long scroll. It's a, also a traditional Chinese painting form. Next page, please. Yes, uh, this is the, the image when we score. A student, students got the original graphics and the forms, then they use it to create. The ex, they extract and transform the natural forms and express them in the three-dimensional uh, form, making sculptures on white paper of certain uh, thickness. Uh, it can be noted that they do not copy other forms because they create their own original forms by this method. Next, they were asked to further create a body-related form. Uh, it's nesting cocoons, design motion graphics, and the set to music and the performance. Although they were already away from the fruit and the vegetables forms, they had started their own creative path along this direction. In this assignment, students were also asked to address the relationship of clothes to the body, music, images, and the sense of the series of the shapes. The second topic is digital objects. The, the topic is will guide students to understand the numbers from different perspectives, starting from the magic mathematics know-how in nature. We will explore how to discover the beauty of digital object in nature objects. After that, we will pay attention to the modulars and the grind proportion and the scale in, uh, in the man-made world. We will also share the aesthetic features in the context of current computer technology. Students will integrate the knowledge related to the digital objects to create visual art. Uh, this is some of the students' work. We can see the relationship between natural objects and the digital objects. In this assignment, students are required to include dynamic to express graphic change. The third topic is artistic. We want students to have a deep and systemic understanding of a man-made object around them. We want students to explore why are the products the way they are and go from the back end of products to the front end to see how designers deliberate products. Students can choose an electronic product 
that they have used and take it part to find out what it is. Then they will analyze the context of use, the scenario, the CMF, and the and assembly. Uh, another assignment is design a way to hang clothes. It is not to design a hang hanger, but to give a solution to hang clothes. We also want students to learn the working method and the design language of famous designer, in particular to learn how to make a good product. Uh, the last topic is a menu for every uh, the environment in community. Um, but the, as, uh, the assignment is currently in progress and uh, is not yet completed. Hmm? <laughs> That's all for my sharing. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Cham. That was really, really interesting. It's, I suppose to... Um, from my perspective, at least to, to um, understand that perhaps there are some strong similarities between what happens in much of the UK on foundation courses, but also some really interesting differences. Um, and I, I, I was interested very much earlier on in the talk where you were um, explaining, I suppose, that, that you were engaging with um, traditional forms early in the course. So using the Chinese scroll painting um, as a technique early on, but then it seems to quite shiftly, uh, quickly shift into dealing with the digital. Um, and I wonder how how important that is on on the course, kind of whilst dealing with the very new in the kind of digital and uh, other, other kind of processes that are, are, are new. How how important it also is to be looking back at tradition at the same time. Oh, we just to use a traditional. Uh, form yeah. a wrong road. Mm. Yes. The, the 10 meter long round road. We just use this uh this 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 form. That's near but Yeah, I think uh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cham. I, I, I think we'll have no doubt have more questions uh, at, at the end of the session. Um, and next up, we have um, Eileen Simpson and Ben White. Artists uh, Eileen Simpson and Ben White are practice-led academics with international profiles for innovative, innovative, engaged research, interrogating modes of production, distribution and ownership of art and culture. They have an interest in generating alternative models for propagating openness and generosity and have contributed to the development of the successful foundation course at Manchester Metropolitan University for the past 15 years. Eileen Simpson is, Eileen Simpson is a reader in fine art at Manchester School of Art and Ben White is a senior lecturer in fine art at Manchester School of Art. They teach on foundation studies and BA fine art and work at the intersection of art, music and information networks. Their collaborative project, Open Music Archive, is an initiative to source, digitize, and distribute out of copyright sound recordings and film. The archive forms a site of exchange and is a vehicle for future collaborations and distributed projects. Recent projects include Everything I Have Is Yours at the University of Salford, Castlefield Gallery, and the Contemporary Art Society, and Auditory Learning, uh, which was part of the British Art Show 8. Their presentation, Foundation Course in Art and Design, Past, Present and Future, Collective Imaginings, explores the rich connections that exist between foundation pedagogy, the transformative potential of alternative art schools and research in copyleft pedagogies. They will highlight Foundation Course's commitment to accessibility, quality and ambition, growth, sustainability and community. The presentation will draw from a range of examples including teaching projects and student work. So over to you, Eileen and Ben. Thanks, Magnus. Um, we're artists that work in collaboration and we both work part-time at Manchester School of Art in the UK. And although we're here today reflecting on our experience at Manchester, 
We're technically here in our capacity as independent artists, as Friday is not our working day for the university. Today is a strike day where our UCU colleagues continue on the picket line campaigning for better working conditions. So it's a pleasure to be invited to talk about Foundation today. In our presentation, we'll explore the connections that exist between Foundation pedagogy, potential of alternative art schools and copyleft methodologies. And we'll also look at Foundation approaches in the HE research context. So we've been teaching for five, 15 years, sorry, <laughs> feels like longer, on foundation, team teaching, learning from peers, creating a culture of learning, and we've developed approaches to learning and making that are open-ended. So learning in a mode of inquiry, starting from scratch, finding your materials and resources and also um, working in an exploratory mode, so learning through doing, responding, risk-taking, reflecting. And um, on foundation, there's always this emphasis on the future. So foundation mode is always preparing for the future. It's ex an exciting space of possibility, thinking about future pathways, making plans. And it happens in these lab-like conditions. So testing, recording, documenting, looking for answers, and establishing the studio as an experimental space. And it's also um, a, a mode of teaching that encourages cross-disciplinary and collaborative group working. So there's not one artist working alone. It's about learning from one another, working across disciplines, and this peer-to-peer -peer knowledge transfer across the network of students. And just to say, many of the slides are from Joan Beadle, who developed and incubated many, many of the foundation projects here. So in the last decade, there's been a massive explosion in alternative art schools. For example, Open School East here, who we've worked with before, School of the Damned, Syllabus at Wising, many others. And the Free Art School offers a chance for those who can't afford BA and MA to learn in a supportive and challenging environment. Foundation, of course, remains in the UK free to many, but arguably could be open further to increase diversity, equity and, and decolonisation. So in alternative art schools, artists can teach and learn from one another in less structured ways, often without formal teaching qualifications and uh, with more opportunity for artists to share knowledge in a peer to peer way. Uh, these programs often share the qualities and philosophies of the foundation. Of course, they're often interdisciplinary with an emphasis on making things happen, often with limited resources and around community building around a shared ethos. They're developing new models of teaching and learning unconstrained by the syllabus and, and uh, formal institutional structure. Often alternative art schools run group projects themed around location, working in site with, on site with a, an artist or responding to a particular set of materials and working with local communities to develop projects and contribute to the community. These last couple of slides are from an intergenerational radio project we did at Open School East in Hackney. So we're artists and practice-led academics who research alternative models for the production, distribution and ownership of art. We research open source and copyleft methods and the distribution of public domain resources. Copyleft is networked and peer-to-peer. -peer. There's the shift from a centralised knowledge uh, to dissemination, sorry, centralised knowledge dissemination to um, networked model of knowledge exchange. So think of Wikipedia, the kind of user-generated resource something that's constantly updated, contested, altered, refined and expanded collaboratively and generates new knowledge and new publics. The owner should be shared, not one owner profits from the knowledge or the artworks and a collaborative endeavour propagates a cultural ri richness. So there's actually a move away from ownership, perhaps to more of a shared usership. So there's an emphasis on generating tools and resources to be used and shared, a richer, more invested participation, which is process driven. So these are the collaborative models we use. They're cross-disciplinary. They, they bring image, music and coding together. And multiple authors generate open source code, opening new possibilities and problem solving across disciplines. Our projects are about future building. Download is enabled, code is released, and it's all intended to be shared upon in the future with this kind of share-alike culture, encouraging reuse and remix. Uh, this is a project we did, ATL 2067, which reanimates the archive to imagine a future public domain. 
So with this in mind, if we return to the foundation projects with an emphasis on their open ended nature, their exploratory modes, focus on the future, uh, lab like conditions, cross disciplinary nature and collaborative group approaches, we can start to see the potential connections between the foundation and emerging models, modes and technologies of alternative art schools and ideas of copy left. So in the higher education institution, foundation is often seen as the poor cousin, but it clearly chimes with the higher education ambition to promote accessibility, quality, sustainability and community. So in the UK, in the current day context, there's a constant fight for resources, for staff, and there's also time pressure to deliver foundation as students specialise earlier in line with UCAS deadlines. And there's a rethinking of the exploratory nature of things, working to shorter timescales um, and developing more creative ways to structure and adapt. And this all increases pressure on staff. And I remind you of the aforementioned strike. Um, but we'd argue that foundation speaks to the highest level of academic research. Artists are always innovating new methodologies. The essence of foundation, learning through doing, incubating new methods, providing the support structure around risky, innovative methods to give confidence to take these experiments forward. It's an exciting and generative space. And I'm often told that researchers in art have good methodological methodological innovation and that funders are particularly excited by this this clearly suggests to me that foundation could have an even bigger role in higher education and we should look to foundation to inform future research culture reaching across disciplines and academic levels from foundation to phd and beyond thanks Eileen and Ben, um, really interesting. I suppose it was, it's kind of fascinating to imagine that um, comparison between the alternative art school and and and, and foundation. Um, yeah, I wonder how. Um, I mean, it would be interesting to for some scholar more scholarship to be done on those alternative art schools and see what happens. In you know, I, I think it's needed in uh other art schools as well but a kind of uh, uh, some kind of scholarship of, of the kind of long-term out outcomes of the people who participate in and what kind of difference it makes to those uh, those people with ambitions to be creative and then i suppose i'm also thinking of those perhaps more conservative alternative art schools that um um uh like the drawing school or even tux banana to some extent which kind of um whilst perhaps there are some interesting people coming out of it. It's imagined around um, a kind of romantic understanding of past models of what, it's a, an imaginary of what art school used to be that they're trying to recreate. And I'm not sure it, 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 it ever was that. Um, and I'm not really going, there's no question coming out here. I'm just kind of reflecting a little bit and saying thank you. And, and hopefully we'll get some questions later on, but it was a really, really fascinating presentation. Thanks guys. Um, and next up, we have uh, Li Zhang. Uh, Dr. Zhang Li is Associate Professor in the Department of Industrial Design at the School of Art and Design, Guangdong University of Technology, Joint PhD Programme of uh, Tsinghao University and UC Berkeley, uh, California. Okay. Her research interests include design history and the theory of speculative design, design ethics and criticism. Zhang is executive editor of Jingsu Phoenix Art Fine Art Publishing, Phoenix Library's Design Theory Research Series, Design and the Times Series. She's presided over and participated in 14 research projects, published 15 books and translations, and published 27 articles in AHCI, CSSCI, and Chinese core journals. Zhang's presentation, Discursive Design for Gender Speculation, Symbolic Design Thinking as Fundamental Mindset, describes a course in design semiotics, which allows for critical speculation and the redesign of gender as discourse. It reflects on the practical and theoretical aspects of pedagogy, which might lead to a more gender inclusive social culture. Um, Lee. Hey, uh, hello everyone, can you guys see me? Uh, okay, okay, I'm beginning. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Zhang Li, coming from Guangdong University of Technology. Uh, today, my topic is uh, discursive design for gender speculation. Um, I will uh, talk about a course I taught 
uh, called Design Semiotics. And last of, uh, eight weeks, once a week, the goal is to enable students to design with a semiotic approach and to review ideas about gender with discursive design. This course uh, takes the fundamental position of gender as a meaning rather than a biological fact and introduce students to four emerging and fundamental design practices and ideas, such as discursive design, feminist design product, uh, semiotics and uh, speculative design. And this poster was designed for last year course. Um, design and the symbols, as you guys know, have a natural relationship that is design has the same orange to sign and designate. Design is making sense of things. So in this course, design is making new sense of gender. And how gender is understood will greatly influence how gender is designed for, for students. So gender is a fundamental dimension of identity for students' perceptions of the world. But for now, it is not given much attention in the current design pedagogy. Uh, this book uh, published at 2016 based on my doctorate, uh, doctor dissertation of uh, 2012 is titled Gender Design Criticism and systematically introduced a concept called the feminist design, which aims to create those uh, elements of mainstream culture that value women. And the course uh, requires students to design and curate an exhibition of three physical light medium that represents the ideal gender identity, like male, female, and uh, unisex or genderless or transgender or mixed gender. Light is chosen as a medium because it's simple, immersive, and the flexibility. Um, I would like to uh, introduce speculative design very uh, quickly. It aims to guide students to use the why not and what if such questions to launch a critical reflection on tradition, common sense, uh, dominant gender presence and discourse. The work, this work is called the layers of the gender, uh, which helps to breaking uh, the stereotype that gender is a fixed fact that is arrow played. Discursive design, uh, as an ontology, it points out that design, in addition to being able to solve problems, can also to raise questions and design based on the certain discourse that provokes people to start thinking and during discussion and communication, thus generating new discourses. This, uh, their two works uh, are all designed by students. Uh, this work is called the Lute, Multi Emotional Lace, which helps to transform a typical a uh, feminist uh, instrument in Chinese culture to express the construct probability of the gender through a layer uh, constructions. Project semiotics as a methodology for the study of the symbolic nature of man-made from a uh, form like product in the context of use, how to express the imagining about gender in two dimensions like uh, in Cadative and the symbolic is the focus of training in this course. This, call, uh, this work is called uh, Ho Yi Suit the Sun, New Virgin. And it is hoped to, that the story of the descent of the shooting the sun will be used as the underlying metaphor to show the audience that gender is just a personal choice. Uh, the above is all I plan to share today. So thank you for your guys' uh, attention and the participation. And I'm sorry for my uh, noise uh, environment, such as I, I'm in a business trip. Uh, so sorry for the inconvenience for all the colleagues. Thank you. Um, please don't worry. I think we could all hear that really well. And it was uh, a brilliant presentation. So thank you. Thank you so much. Shang. I'm wondering thank when, you. when um, you, you deliver this project with the students, is it something uh -huh. that they embrace from the beginning or do they find um, this, this um, uh, reconsideration of how they view gender quite challenging? Yes. Um, I encourage them to rethinking the gender, what gender means for them, and they use uh, uh, diversity uh, ways to express their uh, ideas about the gender. And, and, and at the moment in China, does that feel like a really pressing issue? I think certainly in 
the UK and America, it really does. Uh, yeah, so it's very challenging and critical for my students. I hope that's a chance for them to uh, be inspired by the emerging design practice, uh, especially with the ideas about how we understand the gender. Mm. Because this question concerns as to how to understand you and the, the world and the relationship between you and others. So I think it's very um, meaningful uh, question for students to involve in. And from the last three years of the course, uh, the students love these challenges because I have uh, I was uh, design different uh, subject for uh, each year. Like this year, we were. Um, get uh, ideas from the tra uh, traditional fairy tales uh, regarding to gender concept. Mm. That's great. Thank you so much, Shang. Um, look forward to Thank more you. questions. Um, so uh, the penultimate Petra Kutcher of um, uh, this strand is presented by Simon Packard, who's academic course leader and senior lecturer for the Integrated Foundation Year at the University of Gloucestershire in Cheltenham. Newly appointed this semester, he was previously drawing coordinator for South Gloucestershire and Stroud College. During the past 10 years, he led the drawing days every Thursday and introduced bespoke drawing spaces such as the drawing room and in the round, sorry, and in the round space for expanded drawing, performance and live music. His PhD started at Bath Spa University in 2016 is a longitudinal study of the benefits of drawing days on the creative and employment outcomes some uh, five years after Art Foundation. The drawing days were anticipatory, unmarked, featured projects under the umbrella of the Packard process. Students going feral and learning, rewilding and working as one cohort of 150 on one task. Without silo, groups were modelled in place for four years from 2012 to 2016. Uh, subsequently, the introduction of the drawing room at Stroud Campus in 2018 offered interdisciplinary working, HE and FE working together and student revolt in the form of an artistic dirty protest by foundation students when told of its dismantling. In his presentation, the Foundation Course Art and Design Past, Present, Future Collective Imaginings, he will explore the inconsistencies in work produced at two foundation courses he's worked on, asking what factors amongst different cohorts led to differences in the creative output on the same projects, and how differences in educational histories might account for this. In doing so, he will refer to the aforementioned Packard process, and uh, which were a series of artistic tasks devised as part of the drawing day. Simon, it's uh, over to you. So, can you hear me all right? Yeah, feral and frightened. Um, so, the word feral, I think quite a few of the students on my foundation course, I think, turned feral in the drawing room because they took it as a sort of teenage art sandpit. And, um, and then I'm referring now to where I am presently with the Integrated Foundation Year, which I've got a cohort of 17 that have not done A-level art. They have to do the year to get onto the degree. Um, this goes back to Easter, this slide. After Easter, I, my mantra was the students had to make something at college that they couldn't do at home. So there were one fine art collaboration. This is big woodcuts that they worked on together. And yes, they were doing their final FMP, um, but we sort of ditched that. Um, this is the essence of the drawing room. And at the heart of it, we had a model who said that she'd been born 96 times. She was like a shamanic performer and that led the students down some marvelous paths of performance and drawing and she really drove this darkened room like the locked room in a way i um, mean i've been researching this you probably all know about the locked room uh, you may not know about the third space at cardiff college of art in the late 70s led by tom hudson and I've, i'm that's part of my phd at the moment so this is part part of my research the locked room central st martin's um, this is another workshop where where I worked, the technicians would take a holiday when I, when I went into the print room because I did a very painterly open screen printing, stuff I used to do at Brighton Poly many years ago. And to try to sort of get away from the, the clinical, the sharp edge, the registration. And they loved this. And this is another one. This is drawing on plaster panels that were dis, just not used anymore by the construction students. So we, we, we sort of took over this space and we're doing this all the time now. All the plaster panels are not chucked in the skip. They use as a drawing surface. 
and we've got them all over the college here at Stroud College. Um, first project I did with the Integrated Foundation, Drawing to Delete. Not many of them have drawn, not many knew what a sketchbook was, so I've tried to sort of bypass that. So they, they were drawing, in effect, with a scalpel, and they put all these bits of paper together, glorious shadow play, um, really stiff bits of paper. Um, this is colour capture, a, uh, a project I devised where you find colour in the sketchbook, and it's all dependent on the throw of a die. Uh, you've got acrylic paint, oil pastel, drawing ink. I do this with all types of students and in different scales. I've done it on the walls, in galleries, and they love it. And it, um, This is a new thing I've been doing where students find artist research and they print on it in the style of that person. So this is like Jasper Jones on the left. On the right is Hammer Prints Limited, another one of my likes from the 1950s. So to trying to do something different with artist research. Um, this is a project, every step you take, you chronicle, you know, the journey, you look down at where you've walked, how long you've walked, the colours that you see. Uh, this is particularly, this was born out of lockdown. A very short journey could be illuminated. Uh, another one that they quite like, every step you take. Uh, and this is a, a very recent one. I, I work with uh, interior design students and landscape architect students. So we, we looked at the work of Vassarelli and tried to change it by putting papers underneath it. This was just last week working with an exhibition of my printed textiles. So this, this project was devised on the day. Um, this is a project called Overboards, where the student draws the, the footprint of where they used to live as a child and where they live now. And this is quite apposite because this student here, Kasim, was drawing his house in Lagos over and around his halls in Cheltenham. It's quite a thoughtful project, quite uh, another thoughtful project, uh, carving a bar of soap. The student on the right spent three and a half hours carving this bar of soap, and this was the, really one of her only sessions that she'd done in the class. Quite scared of art, didn't saw the rest of the group as arty. Um, really anchored her in the class. Beautiful little object. Um, this is the present Integrated Foundation course, making what I call big books. A safe place to put their artwork. It's visual. Other staff and students can look through them when they go down the corridor where we are. Uh, this is them learning how to drill things, simple things like that. Um, very successful, I think, these big books. Um, this project is called Transit, where a student sits somewhere and looks at where people travel, the flux of movement. And this particular student's drawings now are in the, heart, in the hand of the catering department because they realised that more male students purchase things. Odd. Um, the Packard process, well, the Packard process is the use of charcoal on drafting film, on blotting paper, and then rubbing it out. It's very much to do with, like, Rauschenberg, rubbing things out, um, trying to insert artist research quietly, silently. Um, and they, they love this. A complete mess everywhere, but uh, this is, the, this is a, a sort of hybrid I've developed with drawing and ink. Um, they do a graphite drawing and then roll white ink on the top and then rub the oil in the white ink melts the graphite. Uh, this is essentially the, the Packard process. Um, and uh, what's next? This is, yeah, and this is a very recent thing where I've taken my students to the dance center at the University of Gloucestershire, and we used Richard Serra's verb list to promote movement. So my students gave them a verb, and they, they operated around that verb. And this has caused a really interesting interdisciplinary movement now and from every Wednesday next semester we're offering workshops to the public to everybody staff and students called closer where there'll be acts on it's in it's in the round we're really proud of this thing closer I think it's going to be beautiful um, these are some of our models performing and finally MC Richards from the uh, Black Mountain College I found this book, it's signed by her. I, I often trace the signature to try to take me back to the Black Mountain College. And I think this is part of my reading. Um, I hope you've enjoyed that, it's a bit quick, but it hopefully gives you a sort of flavor. Okay. Thank you, Simon, that's a, really interesting. Um, th those, the, the closer workshops, so are they workshops that you're running with the students for the public or how, how do they operate? Yes. 
Yes, uh, it, well, on Wednesday afternoons, we're not allowed to timetable. So it's a well-being, it could be a well-being time, it could be a sports time. So myself and um, Adam Gain, the dance tutor, we, we, we've now devised this programme where anybody can call in. It's in a very uh, public place at one of the campuses. And, but it's going to be a rather sort of silent affair, a more like a time of reflection. And the movements are going to be uh, slowed down. And there is seating around. So I, we're going to do it because I think it's needed. And I think it's needed for us as staff as well. Yeah, very interesting. I think it's, it's kind of this idea of um, what's been called a dirty curriculum or yes, you know, a, a yes. curriculum that exists outside of what's possible within a, a particular um, college or university system, I think is really interesting. And um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to know more about that once it's, once it's happened. Thank you. Yes, no, I will. Um, Great. So uh, to close the strand, we have a presentation by Paul Taylor and Kate Timoney. Paul Taylor studied foundation at Southport College in 1978 to 79. He's taught on Carlisle's foundation since 1999 and has been course leader in joint and solo capacity since 2010. Previously, he taught on the fine art degree at the University of Cumbria alongside his practice as an artist focusing on painting and public collaboration and as a freelance cartoonist and illustrator. From 2005 to 2008, he worked as the lead creative practitioner for the Creative Partnerships Initiative. He's been longstanding associate of the Campaign for Drawing and has undertaken residences in Hong Kong, Essex, and at a primary school in Carlisle. Kate Timoney is an artist and writer living in Glasgow. She lectures in fine art at Carlisle, Carlisle College of the Arts and is co-creator of the quarterly publication Parlour which brings together art and creative non-fiction. Since achieving her BA Honours in Communication Design from Glasgow School of Art in 2014, she's exhibited widely and worked on a broad ranging freelance projects across illustration and small press publishing. She began her MLit in art writing at GSA in September. The presentation will explore how visual manifestos are used as a tool for examining and affirming beliefs and convictions amongst the students at Carlisle College. They explain how a manifesto can tell a story of purpose and identity and how during the pandemic they've been able to use this idea as part of an imaginary art school, untethered from customary structures to create a new set of rules. Over to Paul and Kate. Thank you. So, inspired by the In Defence inscription above the front door, a relic of the building's previous incarnation as a World War I armaments factory, Foundation at Carlisle have found ourselves drawing on the concept of the manifesto as a tool for examining and affirming beliefs and convictions. Our lockdown experiences prompted reflection on the idea, the image, the object as a manifesto amidst a context that has stolen any cosy notions of business as usual, forcing upon us an opportunity to re-examine collectively what we believed we were there for. Untethered from customary structures by the constraints of COVID, we invented an imaginary art school where we could create our own set of rules, ambitions, activities, and explore creative models of delivery as a kind of life raft built from the debris of what we had made. Images of ch island chains, Luke's calm, a volupte, green boats, owls and pussycats, a sense of the wider world beyond the online tutorial, freed us to create as a collective of, of adventurers in deep waters. Conversely, after the sun-drenched shores of the Archipelago Art School, lockdown two in the depths of winter became an exploration of light and dark places, lonely spacemen, winter fires and the unseen binds between us. Anticipation of year three of the new normal set us out to define an emotive manifesto at the outset as a way of stealing ourselves as a team, students and staff together for the troubles ahead, facing the music with a studio mirror ball. So here are a few reflections on the concept of object manifestos with examples from our experiences in the form of an impromptu manifesto. A manifesto is a dreaming into being. An audience member in a recent Taishani lecture asked her how she maintains enough hope to make work which imagines better worlds when reality presents so much to erode optimistic energies. In response, she said that she does not need to look outside her work for a source of hope. That when she builds a world within her films, installations or texts, then in some way it is already real. When the first lockdown hit us, we had an imaginative image of a green boat, actually the canoe emoji, that as a course team we invested with hope and purpose. Deprived of any academic context, we felt genuinely adrift, 
autonomous from the college. Branding became a means of taking charge of the narrative and collective imagining became a route through the murk and difficulty of not having a destination prescribed by the awarding body. Nautical imagery, a chain of islands and irreverence permeated everything. Once we can't do things properly, what else is possible? Failure, breakages, shock, harnessed as ways into new directions. The negotiated curriculum became a way to cling together. Solidifying the shared will to believe in something led to some of the most rewarding experiences we've ever had. The telling of the story of an archipelago of students created a new, in many ways, more genuine learning experience. Each year we put a lot of work into creating an imaginative space for students to succeed within. This often means manifesting a vision of the students as their potential, rather than just whatever raw baggage they may carry with them. As we are on a constant journey towards destinations beyond the horizon of the earth, there's always a sense of travelling rather than arriving. A manifesto is a licence to pretend. We run a short workshop just before students devise their final major projects, asking them to write their own manifestos. They define what art is for them and make a piece of work which embodies their declarations. For an intense afternoon, they inhabit the world of the list, then the next morning, they swap. The challenge to give the same level of care and conviction to a, to a work made in the ethical and practical vocabulary of the given manifesto becomes a hands-on illustration of the unfixedness of the practice. Etel Adnan said that our identity is our prison. This can certainly be true in art, students becoming stuck on the things they are or are not as artists, what is and isn't possible for them. And the exercise of reversal, swapping, role-playing the artistic self could be liberating. During workshop discussions, no notions of the contradictory manifesto became particularly helpful. There is often a point in a manifesto which destabilizes the rest, a chink in its armor. And this became a key consideration in the writing process, that even during a blunt performance of certainty, a manifesto can provide a format to play with grey areas. A manifesto is a rocket. So Rossi's image of a lonely spaceman coincided with a lot of work created around the film of 2001, The Space Odyssey, in the coldest, darkest days of January, and seemed to chime with the frozen time of that lockdown, an explorer witnessing. A kind of sci-fi futurism took hold. Significantly, whereas the previous group had defined themselves as islands in a chain, this year group saw themselves as a constellation, disparate but making sense from a particular viewpoint. But as time went by, students who had in some ways become inured to disaster invested more and more of themselves in the ideas they were pursuing, the work becoming a form of self actualization in the absence of normal outlets for exploring self that are open to 18 year olds. So, a manifesto is stuck in time and space. In this way, a manifesto becomes a time capsule as every imagining of the future is inherently tied up with our image of the present. And so each foundation year is time stamped by the intentions we prioritize. Teach foundation for long enough and you feel the currents of the world pushing against our curriculum through the students' interests. Manifesta manifestations of the next thing in, in an embryonic form belonging on a different timeline. As tutors, we have an obligation to recognize, adapt and nurture the new. At the beginning of specialism, we get the students to close their eyes while we talk about the events of the next few months in terms of their large, the larger trajectory of their lives. The daily moments of projects, instantaneous experiments, one-offs, failures, discoveries, UCAS, seen as marker stones on the journey. We ask them to predict something that will have happened in the wider world between that moment and the last day of the course. The predictions are sealed in an envelope and opened on the last day. Things which seemed inevitable in November, outpaced by events by July. A manifesto glitters. The studio at large, whether real or virtual, becomes a manifesto. A collective expression of the energy of the group and their passions. They need to share or withdraw. A negotiation of personalities through organisation of space. We celebrated our return to the studio this year with the purchase of a huge mirror ball. A mirror ball manifesto is a concise but airy form. Spots of light thrown around the studio, like ideas, like scattered thoughts. A manifesto holds no detail, no roadmap. Its value is in its potential to provoke and to inspire. It's a collection of kernels, prompts, provocations, shapes, beams of light without outline. A manifesto is quick. In the studio, the mirror ball lights up the space on and off for about five minutes at around 3 p.m. each day. Each day we give it a spin, try to take the perfect photo of the way it coruscates, of how it reaches to every corner of the room, bouncing off things, chicaning around the weird zigs and zags before the sun moves around the building and the effect disappears. A manifesto is made with urgency for just what we all need to hear at a precise moment to influence a new direction before the moment moves on. 
Whilst in the early stages of the course, when we're getting to know the students, our In Defence project asks them to respond to the writing over our door, asking them what's the most important thing to them right now, what needs to be recognised, highlighted, preserved or defended. They write lists quickly, beginning In Defence of, given just 20 minutes to produce a list of 10, which then forms the foundations of their project work. This rapid ideation process evades overthinking, using speed as a way into divergent thought and as a route out of embarrassment. So quick that it is weightless. If it only took two minutes, who cares if it isn't good? But it usually is. So often the best work is made in a rush. The previous two years have flown at speed, unlike ourselves, with so many swerves, adaptations, transformations and revised motivations punctuating each twist and turn. In some ways, returning to the studio this year and pretending there isn't a pandemic has been more stressful than lockdown. The retrospective realisation that the previous two years were defined by their objects, our boat, our spaceman, led us to preempt events and manifest this year we wanted to live through like a lucid dream. A student asked, because there are no stupid questions, do we have a mirror ball? So we bought the biggest mirror ball we could. An ABBA reunion of a year, a disco year, a year of light. Thank you. Thanks so much, guys. That was that was great. Uh, a brilliant presentation to end uh, th this INFE session uh, with. And we're gonna. Uh, I'll, I'm gonna open it up to questions. But I, I have a, a question to you, Kate and Paul, to start with. Um, and I suppose it, that, that um, in some ways the idea of a, a manifesto seems kind of anachronistic. It feels a little bit like um, it, uh, something that maybe goes back to a modernist ideal, which we don't kind of subscribe to necessarily anymore. So that's the kind of first part of, the, of, of, of my thinking. But then I, th I suppose when you go to ask the questions to def uh, the students to define what their understanding of an artist is or to define their own interest in, ma in making through the manifesto, what I'm interested in, and I think you might have touched upon this in the talk, but it was so dense, is how you stop that then um, uh, reinforcing or kind of propagating uh, particular myths or unhealthy ideas of what an artist might be or a creative practice could be? Yeah, I suppose like the solidity of a manifesto is quite problematic um, and the kind of isolation of one voice. So I guess the swapping really helps with that and then kind of chopping them up and switching things around. Um, yeah, so that the whole thing feels quite collaborative and quite unfixed. Um, Again, I think there's a kind of performative aspect mm. to the to the proposal of a manifesto as well. That mm. it, it is almost like putting on a kind of 1930s uniform in some way, <laughs> and yeah, and there's a kind of absurdity inherent in that, which we kind of acknowledge while we're delivering this thing. Yeah, yeah. Great. It, it sounds like a really um, fascinating way to propel you forward from the from the very beginning. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions. Does anyone have? something that they would like to ask any, well, I think uh, most of the panelists are still here. So Neil has, uh, Neil has shared, uh, maybe that needs to go into the Q&A for, I don't know if everyone can see that who's, who's here. It's not a question, but he shared uh, a link to a workshop which he's running, which people might be interested in. So I'll, I'll ask a question to, to all of the panelists then, if, if uh, there's, there's not anything else co coming forward. And I suppose, you know, in um, when we were thinking about um, the previous session, there was some questions about whether we can repeat uh, the histories of foundation or whether we should be looking to, to new innovative models. And I suppose the question is, is how important those histories and traditions might be and how important that is in relation to innovation. So I suppose my concern is if we if we reject certain histories, do we also, and traditions of the foundation course, do we then also begin, uh, is that kind of anti-diverse in its own way? Do we need to somehow embrace certain aspects of tradition as well as understanding how they adapt to, are adapted for the future? I don't know who wants to go first with that. Does anyone want to? Maybe maybe I'll throw it at Neil then, because it was kind of. Oh, you're muted, I think, Neil. Yeah, I can I can never find the unmute on Zoom. Uh, 
Yeah, it's like a palimpsest, test, isn't it? I mean, the, all those sort of things that make foundation what it is are important. And you, it's not a question of like, you know, eradicating those things, some tabula rasa. Uh, it's, it's maybe like partly, for, well, for me, I think uh, the thing that I've always tried to do with that is, is like or, a kind of organology, you know, which is the term they use in, in music where you get, uh, maybe you kind of reconstruct an instrument that <clears throat> would have been used to play a score in the past. So you can sort of understand to some extent how, how you might um, reperform that score. And we could do that with foundation uh, moments, let's say. You can kind of reconstruct them as performances or like role play or you know, do, do them in a kind of performative pedagogy kind of style. Uh, but of course, they'll, they'll be different, you know, the, say the students, the participants will, will, will engage with it differently. So I, I sort of see like it's all up for grabs, so you can uh, re reanimate it. Uh, but I think when you do it, when you do it that way, it, for me, that's a, a, a good way of doing it because it, um, you're sort of, you're kind of investigating it through a, a sort of action-based research process, which uh, immerses you in the process itself and since there's such an emphasis on learning by doing that seems appropriate so I'm quite a, f a fan of that idea and I've done a lot of that kind of organology myself you know like re reenacting the locked room for seven days and that, that sort of thing uh, it's, it's kind really of like a, a um good a very conscious repetition but also being conscious of the difference that produces rather than just the the repetition yeah. of the exercise. Yeah, it's like a cover version. I mean, like let's say, uh, I think we uh, a good a good example would be like the uh, contra experiment that Roy Ascot used uh, in the uh, ground course. So I've used that in the past, and every time you use it, you get quite a different uh, result. But I then did it with Roy Ascot, and you know, the way that he. Let's say like the way he facilitates it is totally different to what I'd imagined it might be like. So, you know, you just end up then a kind of cover. And the fact that you don't have, say, an experience of that thing first, I think mm -hmm. is actually useful because you, you make something new out of it and it kind of becomes like a, you know, a new work or a new, a sort of like a new method of teaching. Uh, so, yeah, it's there, it's there to be played with. <laughs> Yeah. Chloe's got a hand up. I was thinking though, it's not a cover version for the student. So, you know, it's, it, I, I was thinking this in relation to something a student made in one of my classes and, and it was dismissed immediately as looking like abstract expressionism. <laughs> but this person had never explored working in that way to this person. This is, and once you start working, you inevitably, you work, start working seriously, you inevitably work through questions of art history, I think, you know, yourself. And I, th I think that's, we have to allow the, the kitschness, the beginnings, the questions of the 18 year old person um, and not, not in a way um, use them as kind of ex experiments for our emerging pedagogies. <laughs> that sounds a bit right. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? There's something something like you really have to accept 18 year old work is immediately kitsch. I, I've had to like, not all of it, <laughs> but there's a lot of, you know, there's something of a, of a, of, of, of that moment that's, um, that's theirs and it's there working through. Um, I don't know quite how to, um, Sean's got his, his hand up. I think Joan had a hand up first, actually. Can I, Joan, did you have something you wanted to ask before? Sure. We go to Sean and then Simon. Oh, you're muted, I think, Joan. It's, it's a comment, really. It's about thinking about some of the things that Neil said about that this kind of looking at things and perhaps embodying or performing out and reenacting some of these um, things that were unearthing. But just, you know, the activity of putting together this symposium is, is really, for me, feels quite important that we, we establish this kind of map or timeline of these different approaches, you know, because this feels like it's never been really done. And in, in a sense, comprehensively making a timeline of, of, of these different approaches to paragogy or pedagogy or whatever we're calling it. And 
just just thinking about how we what what would happen if we did start to um, reenact some of these things? I can't be the only person who was a female art student in the late seventies who has a shudder going down my spine when I think of that locked room experiment. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of terrifying, <laughs> but but it would be really interesting to, to reenact it now. Um, you know, just uh, reflecting on that really. Thanks, John. Sean. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on uh, really. Neil and Chloe talking talking about uh, you know the cover version and, and and the sort of method as a teaching style because it, it it's something we we do do as a project. In fact, we will be doing it next week as the first first project in in the fine art. Well, in in all the pathways actually, but certainly within fine art. So the students are asked to um, uh, to investigate a particular area of fine art practice that they interestingly fun today make a petri kutra about for the for the other students so they do that research but they also make a, a the whatever they're researching they find a sem seminal work that they make a cover version of and it was interesting that um sasha and sonia were talking about the cover version that they'd made yesterday of the um a marina of marina of Bramovich and, and ule piece and how they started to when when they when they first looked at the piece where where and Marina Abramovich were screaming at each other. They thought this is going to be dead easy to make this. And then they, they realized through the making of it what had gone into that piece because um, Marina Abramovich and Anule screamed at each other for 15 minutes and they could manage seven minutes at the most. And then they were completely exhausted. And they just said afterwards, well, they had such an understanding of a, of a piece through remaking it that they had had a, um, that they almost dismissed when they first saw it and then through making it had this other understanding. Thanks and thanks Sean. And Simon? Actually, uh, the last comment, um, something that we did in the drawing room, we, we tried to reenact Bill Viola's work. Well, we tried. We had a sort of a big um, paddling pool in the studio and watering cans and things like that. And I, and I think by, by living that, they'd seen that the previous day. I think they then were, were reassured that actually this is momentously difficult work to make. My, my, my final point is that um, as a sort of maker and as an artist, part of the reason that I did the sort of drawing room was as an, as an antidote to the building and an antidote to paperwork and to you know, everything to do with marking. And I had a bunch of students, particularly in the fine art cohort, that over half, over half of the 25 were all going to Oxbridge to do languages and law. And they wanted something from the foundation year and they really drove it on because they, they'd already had a place. So I had these, what I call student drivers. So it really made me up my game. And I think, you know, for, for an experience. And the other thing is a lot of my students were coming two hours to come and I thought, well, you've got to give them value. So I think the place affected what I did. And I, I you know, I think it's worth looking back. You know, I think I tried to knit in my research um, so yes, I, th I think it's it's a it's a valid thing to try, and I don't I don't think we should balk at looking back. I'm, you know, I'm still doing Joseph Albert's work now, so I think it's it's it has value. Thanks, Simon. Joe. Yeah, actually, for me, it's just following on from that. I th I think that thing of looking back and the cover version or the the, the self awareness that somehow makes us feel more comfortable with it. But I. I, I um, I was kind of thinking that when you start to look, people like Tom Hudson, they kind of they're fairly self-aware in terms of they, they undermine their own authority at times, the way they approach things. And I was going to ask Neil, like um, you talked a little bit about uh, Roy Ascot's and your own versions, uh, cover versions of uh, Contra Personality. It's a project that colleagues have done at Sunderland, and it, that it, it really does remind me of quite a lot of what. Chloe saying that that discovery students take ownership of things. They're going to do it. They do it very differently. And I, I wonder what your experience of running it. Uh, well, I, 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 yeah, and then looking at Roy Ascot's version. Yeah, yeah. I, well, just that. I mean, um, I think the first time I tried to do it was it must have been like uh, 1998 or something like that. I think in in, in London and. Uh, there really wasn't any interest in this kind of thing at the time. I think there was like, uh, I remember at most the, 
you know, that um, Annie Davis had discovered so, some of the A-course materials in the bin at, at Central St. Martins they'd been chucked out uh, when the, those organisations were kind of getting re, uh, rehoused. So there was like very little interest in it. And uh, I think when I did it back then, it was part of like a drawing course I was teaching. And it, and it was deliberately trying to kind of draw on foundational stuff that a lot of the students would have experienced. Uh, but the students that I was working with were in their final year. They were third year students. So, uh, you know, it was like a kind of deliberate attempt to get them to regress and go back to like their foundational way of working. And then I think probably the next time I did it, it was at least 10 years later uh, and it was we. MFA students and actually no it was it was part of a thing called I can't even remember what it's called it was it was part of like this um thing that was in Edinburgh called uh Fu- totally forgot the name yet it was a a kind of semi independent organisation for Edinburgh University we did it it was like we did it at three a.m. Uh, through to like midday the next day uh, it was like a, a 24 hour exhibition and then I did it with MFAs and then I've done it with like when I've been visiting other art schools and I, I th- I've just done it so so many different times but usually in the context of some other things that are like that and it might like I kind of like tie it in together with other uh, little exercises that, that, that sort of uh, unravel the subject to some extent but I think when then it with Roy it was uh, I was kind of struck by the way that he does this sort of steersman role like he basically sets it up and then he goes and does his email and people just kind of get on with it whereas when I do these things I've always got in there as well so I just take part in it and just become part of it and uh, then you know you get each time it runs you get a very different sort of feel for how that unfolds. So I suppose it sort of depends on uh, when you're trying to reinvent these things, like how much knowledge do you have or can you glean about what it was that actually happened? And you're never going to get, you know, an accurate understanding of what, what actually happened. So you have to kind of make stuff up. You know, it's it's like enlarging something in a paint and you've got to kind of create some uh, new content to make, to make it work. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I, I think it's uh, partly what's happening in those things is that the participants are kind of inventing the, the actual parameters as much as they're following something. It's, uh, you know, it's like a kind of unfolding uh, play space as well as like a, a set of uh, rules or, or, or starting points. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, a really it's nice very, very different. About- Really good way of articulating it. Actually, it, it, like, <laughs> like a number of the presentations in this strand really seem to um, touch on that. Um, like Eileen and Ben's the kind of idea of different audience or different levels or artists at different stages that they, they experience some foundation. Um, yeah, the, 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 the context and the, the effects, the um, the outcomes. I mean, there, there was one thing I think I think I put it in the chat, but. I know, like, you know, for Roy Ascot, he said it was this whole thing of, like, contra personalities or getting people to work in these um, uh, these these groups, that, that kind of came out of his experience of being conscripted, you know, so, like, that, that's essentially what the army does to you. They break down your personality and get you to conform, become, become like, a, a unit rather than an individual. And, you know, if we're taking a sort of critical... Uh, perspective on it and we you know we'd want to sort of look at how the time and the place where some of these ideas are formed you know it's, it kind of sets up certain understandings and, and expectations and I, I, you know that um the study that, that um kate that kate sloan's book on the ground course roy ascot kind of does just that i think so but we could say that about any of these things you know when when did they emerge and like what was in the ether at the time and why were they thinking that way? It's bit, you know, it's really interesting, I think, as a People, way of doing a sort of history of art as a discipline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. I'd look at students who have done it more recently, the way they revisit and reinvent it, unawares of much of that. It's quite interesting. It makes you know, probably more likely to think about social media or identity or the, you know, something 
more closely affiliated with their own experience, perhaps. Might, might be an opportunity to bring uh, Ben and Eileen in, in as well and to, to to ask them a little bit about their intentions in, in, in relation to that, as you mentioned them just then, Joe. But I kind of... Um, I have a, I have another question for you guys as well, though, really as well. And I suppose it's like what the, about um, intention and um, if there's a if when you're kind of thinking of doing some work with Open School East or you're doing work with foundation students at Manchester, is there a different intention for the kind of outcome for what those students might uh, not produce artistically, but gain from the experience of being involved in in those different um, types of education? I suppose. Well, I think one of the things that we were trying to do with our presentation today was to, when we were, you know, thinking about responding to the call to, to speak today, um, we're sort of thinking where we where are we at and 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 um, how what are we doing with our with our with our research with our work, how are we teaching and what are we doing as uh, um, as lecturers but also as um, academics engaged in research. Um, and, and sort of how did all those lives kind of come together <laughs> and to, to, to bring those all into one space and having this opportunity to show that in this Petra Kucha, I suppose, sort of jammed those ideas together. Um, and it's very much at a kind of just looking at the potential connections. So I suppose when, when, I'm invite, when we were invited to Open School East to do that project um, in Hackney, it was a very specific radio station project a sort of temporary radio station that was set up so I suppose in some ways it's quite different doesn't have the institutional structure or the um the kind of um year-long foundation um drive towards you know the final major project and all of this kind of structure but of course teaching for 15 years you use the same techniques the same methodologies you know you're plugging those into this new context so um yeah I, I suppose it's very difficult to separate those two things in the same way it's very difficult to separate your practice as an artist from your work as a as a teacher um yeah and i also think that for, for me one of the things that interests me about the alternative art schools you know the, the type of alternative art school we're looking at things like open school east is kind of thinking about how there's been this massive explosion and a kind of return to the art school as something which can have this sort of radical potential or could have this potential of a sort of freedom to do stuff outside of a curriculum, which, you know, f foundation, you know, we're talking about the history of foundation and, um, you know, that potential of doing those kinds of things as a sort of, you know, lecture on the ground in a HE institution becomes more and more difficult because you, you know, when you're trying to planning something, it's so difficult to kind of fit something within a timetable or fit something within the kind of um, the squeeze, let's say, of of the kind of marketization of 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 our education. Um, yeah, or don't maybe kind of maybe about how that can kind of feed back and how that feeds back into my practice as a you know sure. lecturer at um, Manchester School of Art, and you know how how I can kind of borrow from what I do outside of the institution and bring it in yeah and those two things can kind of feed into each other um and but also thinking about for me really importantly is the idea of the sort of the new knowledge and the new publics that can be created through kind of open practices through you know open licenses in in artwork through copyleft methodologies through open source practices and how that can kind of feed into foundation education because they're not they the the, the connections between all these three things for me the, is the sort of the same ethos um or, or the things that i'm interested in in these three things kind of kind of um tie together really 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 well mm. and it's so it's kind of trying to pull out those things in, in those three contexts to, to kind of work together to be kind of operational i suppose yeah i think it's important to kind of distinguish between sometimes the, the idea of a curriculum mm. and the systems which that curriculum has to fit into so i don't know if the curriculum is always the bad thing i think it's perhaps yeah, sure, academic sure. systems which they're kind of ugh, which become constricting not least and, and it's not just the academic systems it's sometimes the it systems that we have to wedge things into which which end up defining maybe not how we teach but how we describe that 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 teaching but yeah sure so yeah. okay so yeah i i totally 
agree with you. Yeah. And, and, you know, like one of the things most importantly is just like the UCAS deadline, which is just, you know, shifted. Yeah. And it, so this changes the whole of, you know, so you kind of feel like you have to deliver foundation in a much shorter time. You know, and then there's something that comes after that where maybe you have more freedom beyond the UCAS deadline. Yeah. And it, you know, so it's, it's, it's those structures, I suppose, you know, that, that I, I mean, instead of, let's say, the curriculum. Yeah. 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 And then um, Kate and, and Paul, I'm wondering if, is the disco ball going to be used in a disco at the end of the year? Are there kind of intentions for that to become part of a party? Uh, absolutely, it's a good idea. <laughs> you know, we we do have the kind of um, disco Fridays uh, just to kind of boost the studio. So uh, we'll we'll try it this afternoon, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> basically. But yes, this is a, this yeah. It it sets the tone. It um, and it creates an atmosphere that brings us all together. I think actually, yeah. So, yeah, there's, there's, there's something inherently playful about it as well, I think, isn't there? There's, yeah, yeah. yeah. we camp it up, frankly. Okay. <laughs> uh, ben and Eileen, you've got a hand up again. Who's, who's... Yeah. Uh, Eileen? Can you hear me? Yeah. 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 So I, I just wanted to, there was one thing that I'd written down, so I thought I would share it, but I was thinking about this action based research process, and I was talking in the presentation about this good methodological, me, sorry, methodological innovation, which was, you know, um, kind of seen in a lot of art research. And I was thinking about Paul and Kate's mirror ball and the closed uh, eyes and the dreaming and the making of manifestos. And it was just, it just struck me about how, you know, we have all these rich sort of techniques and ways of teaching on foundation which are so which are all the time being kind of changed innovated build built upon you know altered to fit whatever the kind of circumstances and the context in which we're living and and i think there's a kind of shorthand of uh, exchanging of ideas and building on ideas which i feel is really really exciting and i think we do it all the time and it's, you know what a brilliant idea to have this dreaming and the closed eyes and the mirror ball and the manifesto but you know there's so many other brilliant sort of bringing together of these ideas and i suppose um what i'm interested in how these are this action-based research is captured or celebrated really and maybe this is the space in which it is done but it, it always strikes me at these things that the that we that that we're constantly building on what has been started in the past mm. yeah it's um no i'm really interested in that idea i was uh, a talk by um uh nicholas borio a couple of weeks ago at part of the the cuno network of art schools and i was um i asked him a question afterwards because it kind of seemed to me that some of the ideas that he was putting forward um were, were repetitions of things that had happened previously and he was kind of maybe missing chunks of our history but, but his response was fairly emphatic that he doesn't think that we need to cancel anything from the past that what, what we have to do is kind of build and develop and change back knowledge and keep a place for those kind of traditions and histories and it struck me that there was maybe something similar in what you were saying just then about a kind of idea of building upon um uh, as opposed to pulling things down and, and, and tearing things apart so philosophically perhaps there's something uh, significant there Simon, yeah. Simon, you've got a hand up still. It, it, yeah, I mean, I think that, um, I mean, we all know a foundation course is a sort of a feeder, an entree to a degree. But I always think the students really should think about <clears throat> in, the, <clears throat> in the now and the memory of that will go on in them, not, not just in our paperwork. And, and I think that's really, really important because it's sort of, you're, it's like the, you're interrupting their educational career to do something different and I, I and i and i talk about this a lot about being in the now for instance in the drawing room that they witnessed you know ballerinas drawing in flower and so on and it was that closest that intimacy and they weren't necessarily drawing it they were feeling it and they were it was memorable and i think that's really important to, to emphasize that's what that's my point thanks thanks simon yeah and then chloe you had a hand up and then neil i think yeah, it was just um, on a personal level, kind of being taught in the mid 90s in the UK, you know, how um, so much was kind of cancelled, really. My art history was 
um, post-1960, you know, nothing before then. And um, where drawing didn't have a place, it took me 10 years to kind of find my drawing practice again, because it wasn't something that was cool to do or a place, there was no, so there's a whole generation of people that, that actually drawing, for example, was not part of what we did and is having to, we're having to kind of repair. So I think I think um, there's for me it, it's 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 so important not just not just the beginning of the 20th century but deep into history. I, I loved um, Stuart's presentation because of that, and not just Western history either. And and how yeah, and I work with international students, so it's a very particular. Um, it's always such an extraordinary mix I can have in a group of 15 students. 15 different cultures, nationalities, places, you know, languages, um, where where to begin with that is always fascinating. I think that that's certainly for me, a motivation of having the international, this international network that we can have. So I've really appreciated the Chinese speakers as well today. Just having, and it's a whole, it's so, it's, it's so rich to know, um, not just, I come from the UK, but I'm also displaced. I'm in another culture, teaching in an American system. It's all of those things like in the mix. So I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking as Eileen's idea there, like how we share things, but like, you know, in the, in an international way, how that would be, you know, cross cultural way, how we could do that. Mm. Sorry, I was saying many things at the same time. It's getting excited. <laughs> <It's good though. laughs> important, important, Neil. Yeah, just just on that point about how, you know how do we share stuff. I suppose that's really the the, the sort of aims and objectives of open educational uh, movement. And I think like the, the main shift that's happened there is like a it's been a it's been a while, I suppose, since that initiative has been launched. So uh, in a lot of disciplines, the, the resources, the open educational resources, are already there. They're shared, and they've moved on to thinking about well, what do we do with them, and what sort of publics do they create, and so on. Whereas I think maybe in art, uh, there is some sharing, but it still tends to be more in like closed forms, like books you need to buy and, and such like. Whereas the, you know, the actual, let's say, just like if if you invent some sort of assignment for your foundation students and it lasts, you know, three hours, do you bother sharing that beyond? those students and you know would it be worth your while and would, would, you, would you want to do that you know would you want to make it like an open uh, access um um uh, assignment let's say but i think there's you know at the heart of a lot of this there is this tension maybe that's coming up there between what we learn tacitly and and exists in our memories or our you know muscle memory and and what then can be codified and Generally, art education's kind of followed the tacit uh, means of reproduction and not really relied so much on something being more codified. And, you know, that's the thing for me that I've been trying to understand in more detail. And I've been looking at uh, Japan really for answers to that because uh, Japanese phenomenology is really all about that issue. And um, I think that, you know, in, in Europe, the, the questions that we have around that in relation to art and craft, there there's uh, exists at a social level uh, in Japan. You know, it's it's not just these more sort of uh, non-industrial forms of creation that 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 um they, they feel are, are being reproduced tacitly. So we sort of need to understand that maybe as a kind of folk etymology and that it's been passed on through the equivalent of like the oral tradition or, or like the haptic tradition. And it's not that we we need to stop doing that. It's just we need to also think then about what that means when it comes to sharing things. Get, but essentially, if you share something through a folk etymology or, or like hand to hand, tacit to tacit, uh, it will, will never get much beyond a small pool of individuals who happen to come into contact with you as their tutor. So we do need to start thinking maybe more about how we codify what we codify and whether or not we're going to make that openly licensed and that that's really for me the the, the sort of obvious thing that we you know we could do as you know as a, as a network yeah i mean i think there's a, you know just on another level there's uh you know james elkins has suggested that we all need to write more about our teaching because his claim is that really the fame of the bauhaus isn't to do with how good or it, it, it was necessarily it's to do with how much they wrote about it and how much is written about it and it, that doesn't exist in the same way for many other art schools. Uh, 
And and that's true as well, but you know, as to like say why certain images keep turning up in the history of modernism, it's because uh, you know certain museums were quite happy to allow uh, publishers to reproduce uh, images of works that were in their possession, so they become canonical rather than possibly you know more interesting artworks. So it's all to do with like whether or not you codify stuff, and you're smart about how you allow it to be licensed and reproduced. Uh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, Simon, have you got a, another uh, point, or is that a historical hand? Yes, I am here. Sorry, I was just thinking about the point. It'd be interesting if uh, we did the same project across the world on one day, Foundation, live. Why not? Lovely idea. Why not? Because we're talking about it. Why don't we do it? Yeah, yeah. Because I think, um, why not? You could feed it live. That's a massive cross pollinization of a project. Maybe I'll leave that in there. <laughs> There's a lot of nodding, so I think it might be possible. Ben and Eileen, again, again, there's a hand up there. I don't know which yeah, one. Yeah, really quick point that just occurred to me, which is this this idea of the cover that we were kind of we kind of ran with for a bit. This just thinking about the cover, it maybe is the wrong term because a cover is, of course, historically in music is something which was a kind of commercial technology, and it was something that was, you know, you literally covered one record. That's why it's called a cover. You 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 make a new record and you cover up the existing record. In actual fact, that was a kind of, um, it was a it was a, a hiding of another record, and often that was a, a white artist covering over the black artist in um, the shop. So this this is what the cover was. It was like the record industry trying to kind of produce something different by build, building on something from the past, but but kind of taking it and not. <laughs> and I was just thinking that maybe kind of the idea that sort of the Caribbean or the Black Atlantic idea of the version kind of the remix the dub version is maybe something maybe more useful for us to think about this idea of kind of dubbing the past or or versioning the past rather than rather than covering yeah and there's there's the fork as well as a version yeah so the fork is important but i think exactly. um again it comes down to whether you've got a score or not so i, I always say it's a it's like a performance of a score but of course a lot of the time there is no score so we're having to fabricate that or yeah. There's some organology, so there's this invention going on. So it's uh, it's not quite right either. <laughs> I don't know. You can't, you can't really dub something if it isn't there. Yeah. To dub, you know, so it's quite it's a it's a tricky one. It's like a ghost or something you're working with. And yeah. Always. But I just think that kind of the, the the space between the cover, the version, the dub, the remix is where the interesting thing happens. And you know, I feel like I'm kind of remixing my own teaching and people I'm, you know building on prior you know i don't study foundation teaching at pedagogies i you know i'm just really building on you know as you say what I, what i've learned as a foundation student you know many years ago and yeah. how I kind of developed that as an artist and i'm kind of trying to bring in things from the outside in order to in order to kind of remix those things rather than cover them i think it's it's a bit like having the, the the permission though to to do that you know to, so so you don't get accused of plagiarism or, or being derivative but actually that we admit that copying and, and remixing and reusing is, that, is just something yeah. that we do you know and that's like overcoming a kind of modernist bias that you have exactly. in certain foundational exercises that we still may use without really realizing that but that's that for me that why bias. the kind of the versioning and the dubbing is you know that's where that sort of remix freedom the kind of the the copy left, the open license, it you know has that connection, that parallel parallel history in the kind of the Black Atlantic, let's say. Thanks, Joan. Your hand flashed up then briefly as well. Is there is there something you wanted to say? You're on mute, Joan. It was just it was a thought really, just in in talking about this idea of reenacting things and thinking about you know how important it is to recognise sometimes the format of foundation teaching, which can so very often be, be something like a performance. It, it can be a project that exists as a conversation between members of staff who are teaching together or who find themselves suddenly teaching together. And it can be very much a live thing. It, it can be an in development, um, you know, in development object as a project. 
Yeah, I mean, I think also from from my experience of the you know the very first days teaching uh, on foundation at, um, uh, at Manchester School of Art and being given a drawing project which had probably been running for some years but with no explanation of how to do it. It was like this is this is there was kind of some basic steps, you know, to this drawing project, which wasn't devised by me, and and you know, in reality, I wasn't very interested in, and so and I kind of was thinking I would hate to do this if I was a student, and so there's that kind of necessity to I suppose go beyond uh, 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 an idea of a remix or a cover or whatever to actually take a, an established form and think about how you sometimes reinvent those things as well into yeah. to new possibilities. Yeah. I don't know if I did very well. <laughs> it would Simon, only put your hands up again. It would only work if you believed in it. It would that's that to me I can only uh, the students only believe me if I believe in it. Yeah. <laughs> Simon sorry I interrupted. So I just want one more anecdote. You're talking about inheriting things. I remember before I devised the drawing days I arrived and I was sort of one day a week tutor and somebody who'd been there for years and years handed me a tray and she said that's what we do and it was a box of pliers and they were to draw pliers that's what they had done for years and then I noticed a tweet by one of the foundation students at the break time at about 11 o'clock and the, the tweet said I'm at college if I'm asked to draw another fucking pair of pliers I am leaving and I thought, well, there's that, that, you know, really redolent comments. And I thought, well, yes, I'd sort of inherited this. And, but no, it, exactly, there was no instruction. There was just this sort of um, buy-in. And, you know, so I just thought I'd tell you that anecdote. So it was, it was that tweet that changed things for me. Thanks. Thank you, Simon. I think that's maybe a good place to think about wrapping it up, unless anyone has another burning issue that they want to talk about. So if... if... There's no hands up. I'm going to hand over to Sean, perhaps, for some closing words. Yeah, thank you very much, Magnus, and, and thank you to all the presenters in this panel. That was that was really fantastic. In fact, I think the whole the whole event over over the two days has has gone beyond our expectations of uh, what you know what what we thought was going to happen. So that's um, really amazing. It's, it's, there's been some fantastic presentations today, and there were fantastic presentations yesterday as well. Um, today, they played yesterday's, uh, the recording of yesterday's um, event at Future Lab, um, and what's gone on today will, will, be, will be played at Future Lab tomorrow, the, re the recording of it, and later on, the edited um, version, and we're not going to edit anybody out, it'll just be the, the sort of trimming things, um, will go up on YouTube as well, which is where the, um, the, the first symposium is, is on YouTube now. And, and this will um, find its way onto YouTube in the next in the next uh, few weeks. Um, I'd also like to thank Alia and Gaia um, at British High School of Art and Design in Moscow, who've done all the technical side of Zoom and supported this for us, and Arena, who has been translating everything into Chinese for us. Not a, a fairly thankless task there, but thank you very much, uh, Arena, for that. Uh, I, I do hope that at some point, one of the, um, maybe our next event with, with any luck, we'll be able to meet people in real space and, and not just have a, some sort of Zoom symposium, but we might be able to go to, whether we go to Shanghai or Edinburgh or wherever it is that we might, we might be able to sort of do an event where, where people can actually meet each other in, in real space. Uh, to go back to sort of Neil's comments about, about um, things being codified and being put out there, Maybe, you know, Chloe tried to, quite a few years ago now that Chloe put this together, which is the, the sort of 72 assignments from, from Foundation, and maybe, maybe, we're, maybe it's something that Envy can think about doing, it, it, it is, is collating another, another version of that and, and getting something back out there um, that puts something out as a, as a publication about that. So I, I hope we can maybe think about that. That's what I want to say. But I'd like to I'd like to uh, invite Ling Min in Shanghai and at Future Lab to to just give us the final words before we before we go. So over to you, Ling Min. You muted. Can you? Um... Thank you, Sean. 
Yeah, on behalf of the Future Lab, I would like to thank you everyone here and all the speakers. Yes, uh, we are very happy to work with INFE. Yes, I think it's the next time, not to just the remand, yes, through the screen to have a talk. So, but at the uh, at least, yes, your second uh, symposium, we had uh, three speakers, two Chinese speakers to talk with you. And I think, yes, uh, in the future, we have uh, had more, yes, the Chinese, yes, the faculty and teachers to communicate with you. So we have, yes, like uh, the catalog here, I how to say we have a uh, one page for INFE's program. So at least I think, yes, let the Chinese, yes, art and design academies to know, yes, uh, what is INFE. So in the future, we can face to face to have a panel discussion, to have a forum together. Yes, I have the same, yes, hope as Sean. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thanks so much for coming, everybody. But we'll see you again soon. Yeah. See Thank you. you. Thanks, Ling Min. Thank yeah. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. 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 Bye. Thank you